Good evening, and I'll call to order the uh, February 14th, 2018 meeting of the Falmouth Conservation Commission. First Where's order of scale? business is to vote the minutes of February 7th. Madam, Madam Chair, I did not finish reading them, and I did have some corrections, so unless somebody else read them all. Okay, did anybody read all the way through them? Why don't we then, uh, reschedule this for our next meeting? Got a motion. I so make so second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. So moved. All right, next. Request for a continuance under a notice of intent. Wigwam Sipawissa Trust, 8 Wigwam Road, West Falmouth, Massachusetts. This um, that has already been read into the record. John, do you have a new date? Yes, Madam Chairman. Oh, yes. Sorry, Madam Chairman. Sorry. March. One T March twenty eighth. Hey Jenny, make sure everybody watches out the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Request of the applicant. Um, I make a motion to continue this to March twenty eighth. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The rabbits so moved. Them. Request for a continuance <laughs> under an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation. Susan Moran, 390 and 402 Wild Harbor Road, North Falmouth, Massachusetts, also has been read into the record. Yes, Madam Chairman, they are requesting a continuance until May 1st. As I explained to you, and I know some of the board members would like to have to know there have been multiple continuances at this point there's a large section so an ANRAD for those who aren't familiar with it is basically the staff will go out and confirm a resource area a resource area delineation in this case there are multiple flags in the middle of this delineation line that um, cannot be confirmed at this time so we've Aren't talked the to the now? applicant so We've asked them to continue it until the spring. So, and both the wetland scientist and Mark agreed to that. So May first. So, at the request of the applicant, uh, I make a motion to continue this to May first. Second. So. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. So moved. Next, we have request for hearings under a notice of intent. <coughs> Helma Circle LLC, care of Randall Lilly, Worcester Court and Alma Road. Map 39-16-001A, lots 003, 004, 005, 006, 007, 009, and 010, Helmuth Circle. Private right away in Helmuth Circle, lot 16, Falmouth, Massachusetts. For permission to construct a 40B development of 28 three-bedroom homes along with associated sidewalks, driveways, and the associated clearing, excavating, grading, and landscaping. Um, this is likely to be a, a, a fairly big hearing. And so just mainly for the benefit of, of the board, I'd like to tell you that I'm going to try a little different procedure tonight. Um, we'll hear from the applicant's representatives first, as usual. Then when it comes to the board, I'd like to try instead of going down the table and each person asking all their questions to take the questions more topically. And anybody, um, we'll see how it goes. Um, Betsy has worked kind of hard on this and prepared a little overview and, and we'll kick it off with her. Um, Jen, did you want to? Um, just for the board this is a 40b you are reviewing it under the state wetlands protection act at this time only the zba has not made their determination the um, the zba generally likes to include your order of conditions into their decision so um they are waiting for this board to to finish your hearing process um if the zoning board of appeals does not grant um the comprehensive permit, the applicant obviously will need to come back to you. Right. Okay. And um, on, on that topic, I'd like to also say for the benefit of everyone here, 
especially the public, that even though we're reviewing this only under the state laws, um, I think it's entirely appropriate for anyone to make any comments that they want with respect to our local laws because these are things we may be wanting to certainly include mm -hmm. in our findings and conditions. Um, certainly the findings. So, that all being said, would the applicant like to make a presentation? Um, my name is Randy Lilly. I'm the developer, and we're just trying to get the computer, computer crank in here. Oh. <laughs> well, Steve, can you turn one of those back on? The orange ones that you turn off, Steve. The ones that are written on. You turn them off, the orange ones. And all the rest on. <laughs> That's all we'll of them off. <clears throat> the rest of them on. <laughs> How are we doing? Not very good. <laughs> That's not so bad. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> It might be. Can you project and see how that looks? Oh, that's way. Yeah, it's I think it's more. Uh, oh, okay. Sam, how about the ones that have the little black X's? I think we want to show you that here before the renovation of this room, which is right? in the works or on the on the planning board. No That's what I see. Thank you, Steve. Just start out with a brief introduction and then turn it over to the rest of the team, which is uh, Brandon from Dupree Engineering and Brian from LEC Environmental. Fine, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just a brief overview. Um, the site is 4.9 acres and it's bounded by Worcester Court and, and Alma Road. Um, the site is going to be serviced by all utilities, sewer, water, electric, um, gas. The site is basically flat until uh, it gets closer to the pond and then it kind of drops off. Um, it's pretty much all wooded and a little bit more than 90% of the site is out of the 100 year floodplain. We are proposing 28 single family homes, 7 of which will be affordable, <coughs> are 1,700 square feet. Um, most of them are two stories, um, three bedroom, two and a half bath either going to be salt boxes or capes, and there are three ranches. Um, and the average size lot is 6,320 feet, um, but m most of the lots are between four and 5,000 square feet, with several that are larger and a few that are smaller. Um, I think that's sort of a general overview. The concept is kind of a Cape Cod village, um, cedar siding, um, at least half the homes will have front porches, you know, fenced in backyards, um, sidewalk that's going to walk out, that's going to go throughout all the way to the Court. So to talk more about what we're here, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to talk about Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Brian Madden from LEC Environmental Consultants. Uh, what I'd like to just walk you through is the uh, resource areas on the subject parcel. 
uh, and off-site that projects some buffer zone as well, some of which you're familiar with on uh, recent projects. Uh, but the property affords frontage on Little Pond, uh, Salt Pond to the east. Uh, there's associated bank to that salt pond. Uh, there's also a small, narrow, fringing, boring vegetated wetland system. Uh, then you have somewhat of a flat shelf uh, that extends um, in a westerly direction. Um, that area is all within the flood zone to elevation 12. And then you start to hit a rise in topography. Um, and then it flattens out at the top, and the top of that being the top of the coastal bank where the slopes cease to be uh, 4 to 1. Um, that coastal bank extends off site to the north uh, and is um, somewhat irregular uh, in its boundary based on topography. Uh, you're all familiar with the spring bars uh, <coughs> site. Uh, there's also the Atlantic White Cedar Swamp. Uh, that I had flagged uh, for that specific project uh, and even dating back to 2003-2004 when that was initially uh, delineated by myself uh, and we had gone through an ORAD process at that point in time and during the peer review uh, it was there were uh, I, I believe it was wood frog egg masses found within that swamp itself I don't believe that information ever got submitted to Natural Heritage for a vernal pool certification. Uh, but that boundary, the vernal pool boundary, is about 100 feet away from the property line. Uh, and then the uh, bordering vegetated wetland system uh, is just minimally extends uh, the 100 foot onto uh, the northerly property site. You can see that kind of right in this location. For Brian, I think there's a, I think there's a um, laser. If there's a oh, yes. underneath. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. For the audience at home, yeah. they can. Oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, just to, to, to back up a little bit, the uh, boring, off-site boring vegetated wetland system that southerly lobes right here, uh, the vernal pool boundary itself uh, is about five to fifteen feet down gradient of that. Uh, so the hundred foot buffer zone to the BBW is right here. Uh, the vernal pool boundary itself is essentially 100 feet away from the property limits. Uh, this lobe of the BVW over here is not a vernal pool, it's terrestrial in nature. It is part of the Atlantic White Cedar Swamp though. Uh, and then you can see the, uh, the coastal bank boundary here on site, um, extending off site and then projecting buffer zone here in the dash blue. So that is essentially the most landward uh, resource area uh, and the proposed project is located within the buffer zone to that resource area. Uh, there's about 150 to 125 feet approximately uh, between the top of that coastal bank and Little Pond, um, which will not be disturbed as part of the project. And, um, it, also, as it relates, the project site is not located within a map priority or estimated habitat by natural heritage. And um, as Randy had mentioned, that once you get to the top of the coastal bank, it's relatively flat all the way out to Worcester Court. Um, and I guess maybe um, for the chair's uh, request, uh, are there any questions on uh, existing conditions before I turn it over to Brandon to, to discuss uh, project details? Um, well. We would, we would normally okay. just let you all continue. I think right. it's probably best. Okay. Thank I'll, you. I'll turn right. it over to Brandon. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Brandon Carr with Freed Engineering. I'm uh, with a civil engineer on the project. So I'll just walk you through the, the design and the utilities, the stormwater quick, and then we can uh, get on to any more questions. Um, as Randy said, it's, a, it's 28 single family homes arranged on a 1150 foot roadway connecting from Worcester Court down to Alma Road. Um, the house is pretty much arranged in rows along each side. There's two down here adjacent to Little Pond. These are a about 130 feet, I think, this corner right here off of the little pond edge. So 
these are the houses right here, basically these five or six lots and these two houses that are located in, in the buffer zone from the coastal bank. Um, sidewalk on one side, of, on the southern side of the, the road connecting both Worcester Court and Alma. Uh, public utilities, so no septics, would be public sewer, public water. Stormwater wise, we have uh, for the roofs of the houses and the garages, they're connected into dry wells on each lot. Um, which are sized to uh, infiltrate the 100 year storm. Um, the, the sheds in each of the backyards, they're equipped with, um, since they don't have gutters, basically stone drip edges um, to inf again infiltrate the 100 year storm. Um, the main component of the stormwater system are two underground uh, infiltration basins, one located up towards Worcester Court in this area, and one right at the end of the road in Alma. Those collect all the stormwater from the roadway, from the driveways, and basically the front yards of the lot. So um, the road is basically this ridges where the houses are. So the houses are set a little bit up of the road to send the front yards into the street to be captured in the street drainage and uh, convey to those two underwater, uh, underground stormwater basins. And again, those are also all the pipes um, to the systems and the systems themselves are sized to uh, convey and infiltrate 100 year storms. Um, we've had two peer reviews done, one done by the, the town engineering staff and one done by an outside engineer as part of the, as the zoning board process. And uh, I've addressed the majority of the comments. There's still some um, small comments we're waiting to present to the Conservation Commission to get any feedback before we went back and um, did a final revision of the plans. But uh, none of the comments are anything that we can address. Um, I think the peer review basically stated that the stormwater system is adequate and uh, appropriate for this type of development. There are some you know, tweaks that we can make um, to, to make it a, a little bit better. So um, other than that, um, it's basically my presentation on um, the site design. Unless want any specific questions, I can dive into um, specific areas. But, I think we'll open it up basically to questions from the board now. All right, fine. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I'd like to just make one clarification on the resource area. Certainly. Um, Brennan, you said that which lots were within the buffer to the coastal bank? Because I think my plan shows all of the all of the lots along our yeah, yeah so it's yeah okay so the northern one two three four five six and seven yeah one through thirteen basically yeah one through thirteen I thought you said it was yeah. just the first yeah, yeah the five correct. I, I okay was kind of leaving out this uh, section of the coastal bank mm -hmm. here but um, yes lots one through three here and then four five through thirteen uh, are within that buffer area. And, and one other thing, Madam Chairman, just so they can complete their presentation, and I could have missed this. Can you talk about the retaining walls you're constructing as well Correct. for the so, board? Okay, so there's, um, there's two retaining walls. There's one along the back of lots 12 and 13, adjacent to the coastal bank and Little Pond. Um, and then there's one that runs along the backyards of 7 through 10, and then from two down to six with a, an opening here for an emergency spillway. Um, there is a low spot in the road here. It's not designed to convey any water up to the 100 year storm, but instead just to leave um, almost like a relief uh, swale here so that it would spill out here before it pulled up to any of the houses. But like I said, the stormwater system is designed to capture and convey the 100 year storm, which I believe is 7.2 inches of rain. How big are the retaining walls? Yeah. Um, this wall is, I believe, three to four feet. Um, and these are in the same range, about four feet at the highest, which is, I think, behind lot seven. OK, thank you. Thank you. So now we'll turn to questions and comments from the board, and um, it's up to you folks to decide who's going to answer what questions. At, but each time, I'm afraid you need to come to the podium and use the microphone. Betsy, would you like to open this up? Okay, can I just follow up, go on, on Absolutely. the discussion? So what's the purpose of the, of the wall behind 
you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. On the northern side? Yeah. Um, this area right here, as you get to the property line, if you look at the existing conditions, drops um, in this area to below, you know, this is about elevation 13, and we're up at elevation 18 or so, with I think 17 point something in our low spot in our roadway. So that's basically to retain those backyards. But it's not, it doesn't, it's not the top of the coastal bank. It is not the top of the coastal bank, no. It's but, and where there is, where, where <coughs> when it was flat, when we walk straight out from Alma Road to where it is right at the edge of the coastal bank, you don't have any kind of retaining wall. Um, and it is really steep. Which section do you? Which? So we see where, what is it, number Pretty much 11? straight up from the road. Here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I believe we're creating that lot so that there's yeah there's no wall at that end. Um, the existing grade here is about 17, and then it drops off at the top of the coastal bank. I would assume, um, but we're have you been there? I have yes. I mean, you could drop a penny from like the edge of the edge of the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Yeah, I believe Very that steep. that's yeah that's back in here off our side. I think okay. that's one of the. I'm sorry if I could just. All right. Okay. Uh, I think one of the problems that I know myself had was figuring out where the heck I was. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the markings out there uh, were. It wasn't really staked off, they were just flags and tree leaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, it. I had the same impression, I thought, further up. Maybe it was down here, but I don't really know. But it, it, it was almost totally vertical. Um, yes, that would, those vertical areas, I, I have, the, we got it flagged today. I haven't been out there since it's been flagged. I've been out there previously <laughs> several times. Um, I would assume would be these two coastal bank edges where they're closest to our property. Um, and yeah, as that's where it was. <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. Wanna so kind of get on track back. with the plan here. Yes. Okay. So I just want to make a, um, for those of us and probably most of you in the room remember back in 2005, um, I just want to, I just want um, everyone to remember that this project is, is uh, adjacent to one of the most unique complex of wetlands in Falmouth, including a vernal pool, other boglands, isolated uh, land subject to uh, uh, storm flowage, including white cedar swamp. Little Pond is there, and there's a river and a fish run entering Little Pond just to the north. This diversity of habitats is especially important as it provides uh, high biodiversity, as it results in high biodiversity due to both the complex of habitats and the edge zones that weave among them. So I looked at this, um, I printed out the sections of the, of the state regs, since we don't have new state regs, because we don't use, have to refer to the state regs that often, but, but they're in, on our website, or links on our website. So the first um, resource that I looked at was Coastal Banks, and Brian, where are you? Probably, probably start with you. So these wetlands that I just referred to are bound by Coastal Banks. Do you agree to the one that the ones to the north are significant to flood control because they're vertical buffers to stormwater? Yes. Just to reiterate, you're asking for significance to the coastal banks offsite to the north as it relates to storm damage prevention? Yeah, not entirely offsite. Oh, okay, okay. Well, certainly, yeah. I mean, the, the one um, on site on the eastern portion of the site, um, this particular plan doesn't have the, uh, the topo on it, but you can see where elevation 12, which is the flood zone, uh, intercepts that slope, um, which is about midway up. Um, yeah, certainly that coastal bank uh, can provide storm damage prevention uh, and flood control. Uh, it's obviously not functioning as a sediment source. 
Um, well, actually, I don't agree with you completely. Right now, it's not public. Right now, it's not. You might not have seen any scouring, but it's just like the people who live on the edges of volcanoes that haven't gone off for 200 years that are now going off. If there's a major storm, this could potentially both both these set or both areas of coastal bank could potentially provide sediment. Potentially, sometime down in the future, yes. Um, under existing conditions, there's about 125 to 150 foot uh, forested buffer to that top of the coastal bank on each side of the property, from from Little Pond to the top of the bank, top of the coastal bank. On the eastern. Correct. Yeah. Right. And yeah, and you know the how the contours and the pass I created <coughs> on the Spring Bar site. I think that during that project review, there was discussion about significance of all the different mounds and stuff like that. So I won't weigh in on that. But um, yeah, certainly the east side, mm -hmm. we do recognize that. OK. Um, so I guess my concern is how do you think this project is going to impact the um, vegetation on the slopes of those coastal banks. Yeah, so essentially the standard under the state act is that as you work in a buffer zone, will it adversely affect the resource area and the resource area's ability to provide the functions? And in this case, for the coastal bank, it would be storm damage prevention and flood control. Um, you know, with the, that retaining wall, talking on lots 12 and 13 here, uh, being essentially just offset from the top of the coastal bank, um, you know, it is relatively close. The intent for that retaining wall is in some manner to function as a physical demarcation um, for permanent development footprint to avoid future creeper encroachment towards that coastal bank. But you know, we've begun to take a look at that and see if there are opportunities to pull that in a little bit to provide a little bit more uh, buffer zone protection in that location. Okay, you also talked about, this is a little bit away from coastal banks. Well, in, in this case it is coastal banks, but also the retaining wall in the other area. Are, are you, I, my understanding from, from what you said was that, that it's gonna be, kind of to be providing a backyard, so are you planning to build fill up against those retaining walls? Yeah, for all of Yes, yeah. and those those are fill walls, so the our site would be higher than the adjacent, the, the property to the north, yes. Yeah, so that so, be so have you provided cut and fill calculations for uh, we have I don't think we've provided them to the town. We as part of the design we always look at cut and fills. Well I, I think that would be I think this board would be interested to see what the current topography of your site is versus the, the final topography. Yeah, I, it is It is a fill site. The The roadway on the, the grading utility plan is provided. We show that um, at the low points, the, 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 the road grade is up slightly below existing grade, but at the high points, um, which are down at this corner and uh, in this area, we are filling that road uh, three to four feet in order to convey the stormwater in, in different directions. So uh, it's due to the, the, the present soils on site and um, the A and B horizons uh, available on site uh, not being you know, suitable for road bays and things like that. So there would be imports for road bays, um, concrete, asphalt, things like that. So it would be a net import site um, of, I think we were in the 6,000 yard range over the course of the entire development. Okay, but I think I would like to see. Yeah, that's information we can provide. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, well, no, I, I have one other question, and that is the vegetation on those coastal banks. So how, how do you intend to protect the vegetation? If, if those coastal banks become denuded, and especially that area by, or I can't even read it now, but 11 or 13. 
Eleven. I mean, that's a very steep coastal bank, and right now it's fairly heavily vegetated. How do you, how do you propose? I didn't see any limit of work on your. I mean, I'm, maybe you're assuming that we assume that the entire site is going to have a limit of work. Yeah, there is a limit of work shown on our our site plans, I believe. Um, as Randy mentioned, no. all the the. Lots will be fenced along the back, so that will be a physical barrier along with that retaining wall. Um, it's it's right along the property line. If you look at sheet seven of the plan, but basically it's it runs obviously along the property line to construct that wall down here and then along this wall. So you're going to put in a limit of work before you construct your wall. Correct. Presumably. Yes. Yes. That would be the the first step. Yeah, before any clearing or anything like that would be the. Uh, demarcate the limit of work, uh, put up your erosion controls, things like that. And so your intent is to have no, no damage past that limit of work. That would be the vegetation. Yep. That's all I have on coastal bank. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Go ahead. No, um, that stone wall, the wall along the back, mm -hmm. top of the property is. Yes. Below the house grade, is that right? The top will slopes down to it. Correct. And is there something like a French drain or something in back of it to trap water? Yeah, there would be as part of the wall design. There would be uh, a, so a drain behind the wall, whether it's a curtain drain, a stone wall. Um, sometimes it's a, a sub drain along the footing of the wall. So to try to keep any sheet flow from going over the wall. Correct, and, and you know, connect any of the groundwater that would be building up pressure against the back of the wall. Most, you know, mostly all that. walls have some sort of drainage That's behind them. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, drainage behind the wall. Then where would that go? Um, you can't have weep holes. So you got to have something. Yeah, there would be the some sort of weep hole, or um, a lot of times there would be a footing drain below the footing of the, the wall, which would be sized to infiltrate most of that water. With uh, you know weep poles or something like that, you don't want to encourage water to start flowing down the hill. Yeah, it, it's harbor. it's not walls aren't designed to have water flow over them. Walls aren't designed to have hydrostatic pressure build up behind them. So that's all. Um, when the construction plans for the walls would be de developed, that would be part of that. But we don't yeah. have those details. We don't have those details. Um, Is that correct? Correct. Well, that's something that would typically be done at uh, construction when the exact uh, you know layout of the, the wall would be no. done. I have, that could be a problem if you have weak holes, if you have stone, you fill the back of the wall, you can imagine that directing water through this weak hole yeah. and down the hill. Which is, Into the, yeah, that wouldn't be the work, intention. Correct. Worked out. Thank you. Uh, anything else down here at Coastal Banks, walls, retaining walls? No, thank you. All right, Peter. Jen. Nope. Jen, um, how far off the property line is that wall? Uh, two feet. So two feet. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Mr. Gurney just asked what was going on behind the wall, and you said there'll be some sort of stone trench drain behind. Behind at, on the uphills, like basically the um, typical okay. wall on your property or on our property. There's no work proposed on. That. No, I understand there's no work, but is it basically south of the wall and north of the wall? Um, is south it on? Oh, so it's on. It's mm -hmm. it's on the the retained part of the oh, wall. The retained so the okay. High part of the wall. Okay. And so it's two oh. feet off, and you can dig your your footings for that size wall two feet off your property line. Um, typically. What we would propose here would be some sort of uh, gravity wall, big block wall, which you would place the blocks and then fill behind them. So there wouldn't be a need, well, the footing would be from the face of the wall back, typically. Okay, and how deep does your footing have to go for that type of wall? Um, I'm not a geotechnical engineer, so I couldn't. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, I'm just typically thinking that. It would all depend on the site. You type don't of wall. come before our board a lot. I am a yeah. stickler for limits of work and being able to provide the um, contractors on site the ability to to build these structures without one encroaching on someone else's property or two. And I'm just thinking that two feet 
if they have to dig, you know, what's the overdig on the footing that you're, you have to install on this wall. So I think maybe having kind of more detail on one, as Betsy said, your cut and filled calcs into the, the retaining walls themselves mm -hmm. would be really helpful to us. Yeah, we could provide a typical wall section and, and show basically where the property design would fall in and work and all that. Okay. And regarding the one along the coastal bank on Little Pond, <coughs> how far off the coastal bank is that one? I think of the tightest spot, which would be behind lot 13, the house on lot 13, it was uh, six feet. That would be right in That's six feet? This area down here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can get you exactly. Yeah, can you, can you, because that's, that, I'm really concerned with that wall. Okay. Um, I'd, like actually, said, I'd actually like to see that wall pulled back off the top of that coastal bank as much as possible. And that, if that even means pulling the house lot 12 and 13 closer to the road, um, I'd like you guys, uh, I'd like you to explore that. And that's something, like Brian said, we've been looking at shifting those houses and, uh, yep. and bringing that wall back or shifting the houses enough to eliminate the need for that wall. I, I think that would be really helpful. That's it. That's it for walls and banks. On the same subject, where the wall uh, is, well, there is, is there a wall in back of 11? There's no wall. There's no wall no. in back of 11. Okay. Okay. I think so. Lauren, a um, couple questions. Um, and I, first thing I'm going to say is I, I did go out to the site three times. I went out there today um, twice. In the morning, it was nobody was there. When I went later, somebody was there. Mm -hmm. um, how did you? Um, did you have a GPS to flag? I mean, so yes, he had a he had a GPS. Okay, so. all right. Um, and I know that you're new to this, but Brian is not new to this. Um, staking is really important. Um, we really were walking around lost in the woods. Um, not now that you see, and you can see it on paper, but not being able to know where the property line was. They were never staked. The property lines were not staked at all, still. Nope. So that makes it very difficult for butters, for us. I would think it would be difficult for the town engineer to even go out there, anybody. So. We're go you're going to have the opportunity to go out there and stake it because this is going to get continued and then it's going to be properly staked under the guidelines of staff so that they're not just flags fluttering around in the, in the wind but they're actually stakes in the ground where we can see where lot 12 and 13 are and where the walls are. So I'm going to get off the soapbox about that but it's very disturbing. We're all volunteers. We spend a lot of time on these projects and we go out in the field, open-minded, to see things. And when we go out there and all we see is a forest with trees and no staking, it instantly gets us a little upset. We like the forest with trees. We like the forest <laughs> with trees. So um, that being said, could you please show me, and Courtney and I are trying to find this limit of work. Could you show me what it looks like um, on this? I'm on sheet seven. Sheet seven. Now, what is all this along the, all, where the houses are? On all the roads, I see a line that looks like a wall, or, or is that the limit of work? Um, you're saying behind our proposed houses? Yeah, like lot 14, 15. There's a little line with little. It looked like because uh, you don't you don't have a um, a legend. Yes. There's a double a, line. It's, it's a, a double a, line with little gizzies in it. Yeah, that's a, a about two feet off. What is that? The, so there's two a, feet off the line. Yep. Is that, is that, a sidewalk? Is that your it, limit of work? Um, it's a stone drainage trench for the backyards. Basically, there's oh. sections of the mm -hmm. of our lots in that flow back towards the back property line. There's uh, portions of the adjacent lots along Alma that currently stormwater flows onto our site. So we designed a, a stone infiltration trench to to infiltrate <coughs> that runoff. Again, you're new. You get you get one round making making mistakes. Next time on the legend so that we don't have to make, we're making this up as we go. I looked at this and I had three things. Is it a stone wall? Is it a limit of work? Or is it a sidewalk? And now you just clarified it. It's none of the above. Um, it's, so, if you go to lot 26, uh, there's a label there and it's described in the stormwater report. If you uh, 
um, one of those big, uh, look into it more, but it's basically, uh, it's, I believe it's two feet wide, three feet deep, stone trench, um, that size to infiltrate the, the runoff from the backyard. Basically. On lot 26 on this plan? On, on lot seven? sheet seven? Yeah. Right behind lot 26? Yeah. Backyard well, I don't have it on my sheet. Sorry. Here we go. Yeah, it's Maybe it's on the yeah, top. It's on. Oh, it's all oh, way at the top. I'm sorry. I'm in the top. Oh, it's in the top view. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. That helps me with that. Again, um, I I did not go through every inch of this plan because after not seeing it stake for a week, I sort of was giving up a little bit on it because I thought it would be a procedural denial tonight. But because no, of the I'm audience here, we're listening to it. Some some respect to them um, because usually we would not even be looking at this. Yeah, so, I apologize for the I know. staking. We get it. We totally get it. And it's Valentine's Day, and these people are all here, and we're going to get this done. Um, I see the limit of work. Yeah. yeah the limit of work is a, it's a it's dash line. It's a dash line. line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just doesn't come across in your plan because the dash line kind of blends into the bold line. It runs right along the property line. Yeah, it runs the into the, yeah. Okay. We can, um, when we provide revised plans, we'll do it in post to make it really pop out. Thank you. So if you go more, if you go to yep, lot 28 and look down, I see it now. I'm on the. I yep. was on the bottom of the sheet. Um, There's a dense line in this. So my question to you, that, in the perk, I know you're sewering, you so we don't get the septic perk rate. But what is the soils there? So uh, it's a very fine sand. Um, we did double ring infiltrometer testing, which we used uh, in our stormwater design. Um, the results are in the stormwater report in one of the appendices. The um, infiltration rate was, I believe, the high was from the 60s, 60 inch an hour up to 110, 120 okay, It was very inch perkable, that's very perkable. perkable. Okay, so very I just perkable. want to clarify that. So this is where I'm going with it. Um, digging in clay, you keep a nice vertical wall. Digging mm -hmm. in sand, you have a very yep. prone. So you're saying you can install these walls and do all these fancy infiltration things and everything else in this very permeable um, soil. So I just I'm I'm very concerned how that's going to happen without being on other people's property um, and having overdig. Mm -hmm. So because you, you're not allowed beyond your line, um, how are you yes. going to do that? So the walls, um, I'll kind of go through each. The walls are all in fill; they're fill conditions. So we would be basically building the wall and filling behind it. So there'd be very little actually excavation for you know clearing just the A and the B horizon. Um, so you know, 12 to 18 inches down to get the, the to the sand layer and put the footing in. Um, the stone infiltration trench, I believe could it's you, too. Could you digress a little bit? So you you are putting a footing in. Yeah. I, it would yeah. depend on the fi the final design of the wall. If we went with something okay. like a versa lock wall, a uh, segmental block wall, there would probably be a footing. Okay. On something like this, we would tend to lean towards uh, a bigger block, a gravity wall that doesn't mm -hmm. need a geo grid. Um, or a footing, and it would be okay. basically excavating, putting in a stone base, and then because in foul, if we anything over four Quite feet, anything above you know four feet or bigger, it has to be engineered. So you will Correct. have to have a structural yep. engineer. All right. So just so you know that. Yep. That's that's. Yep. Yeah. All right. And then the next question I have. Um, this is New England. We had a great winter this year, but we have snow, and I'm really concerned where you're going to put it, where it's going to be melting and running into wetlands. And the only place I see on this property where you could push a snow plow is between lot 11 and 12. 11 and 12. And um, it's the only open space or between the, um, the road onto Alma Road and 13. So. Uh, With all the salt and chemicals that are in the snow when you pile it. Correct. There would be no intention to pile snow there. There's two areas where the underground infiltration systems are here along. Um, Alma in here, up adjacent to Worcester Court, that could be used for, for okay. snow storage if needed. And both Perfect. those areas are graded to uh, drain into the roadway. Okay, then that's, um, that's the next thing I'm going to go to. The drainage, uh, I really am not too keen on the emergency drainage spillway. swale, spillway. As soon as you said spillway, that means that you have obviously pitched something to go that way. And, but you told us that everything was going into these underground systems. Yes. So, so um, Nothing's pitched to go over the spillway unless there was some sort of failure of the stormwater system and the only, it would go over the spillway instead of being directed towards one of the houses. Um, the collection system, so the catch basin inlets, the pipes, and the underground system have all been sized to 
collect and infiltrate the 100-year storm with minimal ponding in the roadway. Um, I believe at that area I was talking about, which is right here between lot six and seven, there's enough uh, potential storage in the roadway to pond up a foot and a half. If that was ever a failure before, it would go into that storm, uh, that potential spillway. It's just a, um, an extra measure instead of something catastrophic happening and flooding out these homes, it would have an overland uh, exit from the site. Okay, as long as it doesn't become the site. Yeah, correct. In, in, in the stormwater analysis, we've shown that up to the 100 year storm, storm, there's no intention to send water over that. Over that well, <coughs> yeah, but that that's a, is a concern. I don't know how. I have a question. When you were discussing <coughs> the drainage, and I'll, I think Courtney wants to go back to the retaining wall issue, but when you were discussing the drainage, you said that the drainage was for the road and the driveways, correct? Correct. Did you take into consideration mm -hmm. the roof run? The roofs, there's um, dry wells under each driveway, there size is. for okay. the roofs. Okay. okay, excellent. For the roofs and the patios. The roofs, the <coughs> patios, the front the <coughs> garages. Um, I think we have a note on the plans and we've um, intended that any backyard patios would be pervious pavers. Okay. Um, and as the town engineer pointed out, um, has, are you going to limit construction on the lots to what is designed? So let's say somebody wants to put a bigger patio or an addition or something like that. Have these you know, drywalls been sized to handle that? Or is there going to be a restriction on the site that, you know, what is constructed, is there going to be like a covenant or something placed on the village? There would be some restriction on what, then the approvals would be to what's shown on the plans currently. So there's 28 lots, uh, 10 are shown with single one car garages, all are shown with a shed. And I think 23 are shown with an optional uh, sunroom or patio off the back. The stormwater has been designed for that potential maximum build out. So if every, so everything all shown on the plan was ever built, the intention is um, that that would be the maximum amount built and it may not, um, you know, people might not build out a garage or a sunroom. So it would end up less than that. And typically we add a 10% uh, factor anyways okay. on, that, on our stormwater system. Now, when you went back and said it will be in the approval, whose approval? It's come up at zoning, so okay. I would assume it would be noted as part okay, of that Okay, so you're approval. not gonna have any covenants in the neighborhood or anything like that. There's not gonna be a homeowner's association with a covenant saying, you know, this is it. There will be a homeowner's association, so it's something that we could, we could add. Okay. I'd just be concerned about additional stormwater runoff. And um, I am gonna, uh, echo Maury's concern when you said spillway and I had read it in the engineering thing. I'm not quite sure and I'll have to check, but I did not realize somebody could discharge stormwater off of one site onto somebody else's property. You can't. And it's, it's not, it's, it's, we're not doing that. It, the intention is that there would be an overland flow in case of an emergency if the system, it's no different than a yard being graded towards somebody else. Um, you can't in the town of Falmouth. You can't okay. grade to somebody else's yard. It has to all be maintained on and your yard. If you re, uh, in our stormwater report, it is shown that we're not increasing flow off the site. Well, I guess if we put that across that wall, then that won't be a problem. And you don't let it go down there. But the other question is, why wouldn't you put it on where you have this um, underground system? Mm -hmm. And they have these wonderful rain gardens now that they design where it's not just, you know, it, obviously this is going to be covered with turf. I don't know what, what is going to be on this system. It would be grass. All right. So you could actually make a swale so you could bring that water instead of it going toward the vernal pool and the white cedar swamp, which just so you know, that's probably about the, one of the worst things you can do to a white cedar swamp mm -hmm. or a vernal pool. Like that, that'll kill them right off. Mm -hmm. And those are the two probably most coveted things we have <coughs> with conservation are salt marshes, vernal pools, and white cedar swamps. So if you can somehow design that, because you're pitching all the land, the whole thing's going to be denuded, it's going to be a flat moonscape that when you get ready to do it, that you can bring it down toward 
that and make a, or maybe in these lawn areas, you know, the big lawn areas for the 13 and 12 and 11, that you can make some sort of swale there and um, or a basin, a rain garden basin, mm -hmm. so that you're not discharging. There'll be some sort of you know retention and percolation away from those um, valuable resources. Um, and I know everybody's concerned about that whole. Um, I did read the report from the town of Falmouth, and there were a lot of comments that still remain. A lot of them are not pertaining to us, but um, and they will get addressed. But that, that was one of them. That is. wall has the, the weep holes and everything have been a concern. Um, and I think um, let's see what else. Snow piling the soils. Can I go? Can go I go on, back go. to the weep holes on the wall and the, the spillway? Um, on page four of the, I believe it's the town's review of the the drainage. Um, his first comment was, um, I mean, the first comment, the first bullet point comment on that page. Um, <coughs> after you had done the revisions, he mm -hmm. says that, that that his comments remain, and it was that the town of Falmouth requires all stormwater runoff to be contained mm -hmm. and infiltrated on site. The drainage report indicates that not all runoff is contained. In the drainage report, an increase in peak flow discharges, albeit minimal, they are increases mm -hmm. to both Alma Road and Little Pond for the design storms indicated. The design's been changed since then. Sir, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. okay. So since we met with the, the town engineer and he, he issued those comments, we have um, added uh, some additional measures to, to, to meet those yeah. requirements. Okay. Um, You'll submit those to us. Correct. I know that he did say, you know, he did revise this, or, or this came to me on, like, the 17th, and it was, you know, comments remain, comments addressed, comments addressed, comments mm -hmm. addressed. Have you met with them again on the ones that still remain? Is there a revision past January 17th think, that you know of? I think most of the ones that remain um, are related to uh, town standards that we're asking for waivers from um, in, the, in, the okay. in the zoning application. Um, the stormwater one is one that we met with them on and we basically explained what we would um, do to address it and he's seen basically um, when we resubmit. And you met with Scott? Scott. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Courtney, did you have something you wanted to bring up? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm yeah. Just, I'm more or less, or coastal banks and the wall. No, I'm walls, just. Um, walls and walls. And yeah, I want to talk about that. Um, and it's all start and echo what um, Maury had to say about staking the lot. Mm -hmm. I wasted my time out there yesterday wandering around looking at flags that meant nothing and going on to other people's lawns and property and I thought that kind of turned me off I, I so apologize. I hope you'll get it fixed sure. um, now should. now the next thing is there are a lot of loose ends here it's very evident from the questioning and your job between now and the next continued hearing is to tie up the loose ends. And I think there needs to be a lot more specifics on a lot of different things on the how-to part of it. You sort of glibly stated, well, well, we'll design that as we go. Well, that leads to problems. And particularly when you're in a sensitive area, we want it spelled out and clearly understood where we are. And I'll start with this um, retaining wall back there. You've got, what is that retaining wall? Is it a modular wall? Is it Board in place? No. We don't know. So we need to know that because that has a lot of bearing on how you construct that wall. I've been in the business, construction business for 30 years, so I understand the dynamics of it. And as Maury correctly pointed out, you've got sand, you're going to have wall. It's not like building, digging in clay. So just, you know, you're, you, I'm, I'm concerned that you can't build that wall two feet close to that property line on the back side toward the coastal banks. With two feet, you've got to put a retaining wall, you've got to put a limit of work in there with hay bales or some other form of, of retention. 
And then you're going to have room to excavate. But I want, I want to know what that's all about. That's what the board wants to know. And we can provide that information. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm skeptical that in two feet, I've, I've dealt with these walls, and I know, and I built stone retaining walls just like this in similar situations. So I know it's, it's, it can be done, but it's tricky. And, you know, part of it has to do with the footings and how deep are the footings, how wide are the footings, how, you know, all of that. And, and without that information, we're all wandering in the dark. Um, I'm concerned, second of all, about, you know, it's fine that you've got lots of downspouts and you're taking all the water off of the roofs and off the road and so forth, and it looks great on paper. But when I hear you tell me, oh yeah, we're going to put the dry well in the middle of the driveway. And you're paving the driveways? Correct. Okay. And how long is the shelf life of one of these dry walls? I mean, how big is the dry wall? Is it a two by two with some stone around it? It's um, detail on page 11. It's uh, three feet deep. And the footprints are around 120 to 140 right. square feet. Now, I understand you're going to cut all the trees down so there won't be very many leaves falling in the gutters, but there's still sediment that gets into those gutters. Sediment goes down the downspouts. In, and where does it go? It goes into the dry well. How long does it take to fill up a three-foot dry well? And so what's the maintenance plan? doesn't seem very practical that you're going to put put this in the driveway and then foist this off on the poor homeowner five years down the road when he's going to dig up his dry, uh, dry dig up his uh, driveway to replace the drywall it's overflowing all over his lawn down the street and onto other people's lawns and those things so I, I think we need a maintenance plan um, there's a operation and maintenance plan that was submitted as part yeah and of so that. who's doing that uh, there's the drywalls would be the responsibility yeah, of the yeah. individual homeowners. Right. Okay. So you're you're making it tough for them by putting it in the driveway. Something we can look at. You know, these are the these are kind of practical things that if somebody in the business and the construction business who has to deal with it, particularly deal with the consequences of this. When I get a call from a homeowner saying, you know, all my drywalls are backed up. Oh well we gotta dig up your driveway. That's only gonna cost you another Five or six thousand dollars because we have to get an excavator out here and repave it. Do a better job than that. Just to follow up on the operation and maintenance plan, Brandon, you said one has been submitted. Was one submitted? I believe so. Yes. To to us. I believe so. Um, I can confirm that. Uh, I can I can look in the main file because I just don't have it with my stuff. So and I don't see it in the stormwater report. I just say a separate operation and maintenance plan separate. will be. Um, submitted. I can. I can look. So, so who's responsible for maintaining all the roads and all that? Yes. There would be a homeowners association established. And are you going to have clear covenants to tell them what they have to do? Are you saying you shaking your head? Yes. 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 That will be part, part of the homeowners covenants, correct? So we want methodology. We want to know how you're going to build this wall. We want to know a maintenance plan. We want a little more. I want more information. Um, more. Uh, just a fast, quick point. Um, when we have steep banks like this, we usually require a double row stake straw bale okay. line. And I just want to bring that to your attention because, um, and you can't put anything against them. That will be, that's always in our standard conditions. And I just want to make sure that you understand, you know, a straw bale is almost two feet wide. And if they're double row, they're four feet, and you're already two feet off the lot line. So just to make sure you know what your limitations are in working in these areas. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Uh, I saw in this uh, stormwater report, at least for some of the design, you used a factor of two for the infiltration rate, a safety factor. Yes. Is that yes, right? yes, yes. 
And does that also apply to the stone uh, fringe grain along the back of the lots? So for the infiltration rate we use, we, like I, I said, we did the double ring infiltrometer testing. I think we did uh, six or seven tests throughout the site. We took the lowest infiltration rate and then we halved that. And that's the factor of two um, that you're referring to. And that's what we use for. And that applies uh, to both. For the, all the infiltration BFPs Including the trench. Including the trench, the dry wells, yeah. the underground base. should be in pretty good shape. Um, I would, I would agree. Yes. Um, Brent, Brandon, we don't have okay. your operation. I will, I'll make sure we get that. And started. if you could submit, like, um, how many copies? Eight, um, eight, ten copies okay. of the operation and maintenance plan, just so the board can review it as well. That would, it would probably be helpful for them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we exhausted this. Yeah, no. oh, Mary. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> what do we have in there? Yeah. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Peter, yes. Yes. Uh, you have referred to the 100 year storm as a reference, and I think it's uh, the 100 year storm or the actual maximum recorded storm. Uh, what figures are you using for rainfall? Um, the, the rainfall amounts come from the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook. Seven and a half inches. Seven and a half inches, or? Uh, yes, I'd have to look. I believe it was 7.4 or 7.5. I think we have it in the stormwater, but I said go look it up. Well, okay, but uh, have you checked the maximum recorded for this area? Uh, I actually looked up the at least the past two years, um, and it was 3.8, I believe, in the closest monitoring station to the site. And where was that? Um, East Sandwich, I believe. I, I can get the, the data I have in my pile over there if you want. Okay. All right. Okay. You all set? Betsy. Um, Brian. I don't want Brian to feel that well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Page three. in the NOI, you referred to using um, the same BBW line, and I'm not sure the BBW by the pump, by the little pond, or the wetland edges of the Vernal Pool and the White Cedar Swamp. But anyway, from an ORAD issued in 2004. Is well, that correct? I mean, that was in page three. Yes, no. I, the wetland boundary, um, at least, <coughs> the wetland boundary over here, I believe, that was, or at least a portion thereof, was updated recently for the uh, Found Housing Corps um, project, but I don't believe this one has been subsequently updated. Uh, that is off site on that property, so we don't have access to flag that. But again, the, the most landward resource area is that top of the coast. Don't they need to get permission to do wetlands that are, have buffers within their project? They need to have permission to um, go on somebody's property, yes. But shouldn't they know the distance from those resources to mm -hmm. the project? Mm -hmm. And doesn't this property belong to the town of Falmouth? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that. Mm -hmm. If you if you would like to go out and flag those wetlands, you can ask me for permission, <laughs> since the CONCOM is the one that has care and control on that property. We would absolutely give you permission to go out and flag the wetlands. If, if that's the request of the commission, we could. Well, I'm just a little concerned. Yeah. I mean, this is 14 years old, and presumably sea level has risen a little bit. Groundwater may have risen a little bit. I mean, who knows what? Yeah, I, I think this boundary is, is pretty solid based on my observations. I had re flagged that back in November 2016. Um, and at that time, I had looked at, at this, uh, but didn't reflag it. Um, it didn't look like there was any changes, but certainly if 
you know, if the commission would like us to just reconfirm that edge, uh, we'd be happy to do so. It, it currently stands about 50 feet to the property line. Betsy, do you want it reconfirmed? Please reconfirm that boundary, Brian, <laughs> and have it resurveyed if it is the changed. closest point. Yeah. I mean, I don't know yeah. how you would know being in the field whether it was the same as it was 14 years ago. I have a good memory. <laughs> You remember, uh, the, you remember the plants that were at the edge? That <laughs> yeah, th this this portion of the, the Atlantic White Cedar Swamp is, um, it's, as I said earlier, it's terrestrial, so it's not inundated. Uh, it's not within the ILSF uh, area. Uh, there is a little um, excavated, previously excavated ditch that connects those two lobes. Mm -hmm. If you remember that westerly lobe, that's where the vernal pool was. And, really doesn't see any flow connecting to but once you get over here it's it's high and dry but there are uh sea, atlantic white cedars mm -hmm. so. and again i didn't think it was super critical at the time given that the top of the coastal bank was the most landward but certainly we can uh reconfirm that edge we'll just spot check it yep absolutely thank you and i will give you permission right now that you can spot check that wetland thank you Okay, uh, eventually I'm going to get back to coastal, to vernal pools and mm -hmm. roll, but I have that under the, the buffer area. Mm -hmm. But my last comment about B BBW, since I did look in the state regs, is I thought it was an interesting comment that um, BBWs are probably the Commonwealth's most important inland habitat for wildlife. Again, just to stress that this is a this is a complex site, both in terms of plants and animals. And that, so that's all I have. Other people have BBW questions. Then the next section is buffers. Are there any BBW questions from the board? Total agreement, Betsy. Uh, or comments? I have a question for the board. <laughs> you have a question for us? Yes. <laughs> um, so, Based on, for the limit of work, erosion control, uh, the plan that we are in the process of developing or, or kind of reinforcing is that the entire perimeter of construction footprint will be, uh, we're going to install uh, entrenched silt fencing. Um, and I was just <coughs> curious if that would uh, be adequate uh, to substitute for the double row of silt sock. A hay bale, a not a silt sock on this site. It's too Not steep. with that grade. Well, if say if we pull back this boundary a little bit, we're, we're on a flat area. Can I make one comment? Yes. Only sir. because I, I, I do work in the dirt. And one of the things is everything looks wonderful on paper. We have storm events, grounds frozen. We have seasons that are dry. We have seasons that are wet. You have such a tight limit of work. When this is all denuded, it, it, it think, you're not going to have all these wonderful controlled elevations that you're showing us where we're going to put the water over here and it's going to go in this basin. When this is denuded and there's no asphalt and nothing's planted, that water is going to go wherever it wants to go and it's going to go probably to the wetlands because that's where it's downhill slope. And when you have these guys in a big project like this digging everything up with that type of soil, I, I can go to any site and there's always material against the limit of work. When it's a sock this big, that's how big a sock is. That doesn't take much at all for silt with one rain event like we had last Thursday of almost four inches on frozen ground to sheet that sediment against that and overwash into the wetlands. So that's my concern when, I mean, again, on paper, all done, this is all gonna work probably beautiful with all your calculations and your scientific engineering. But as a dirt digger, when that thing's denuded, it's not going to work. Yeah, I don't like salt socks. <laughs> what was that? I don't like salt socks. Amen. I'll no. suck it back. No, you can't. You can't. I, I kind of figured I was going to get that question eventually. No, I didn't expect it in the hearing, but I definitely expected it from the contractor um, for the salt sock, and my answer would have been no. Not, just not on this site. So, At least not on the northern boundary of the site or the eastern boundary of the site. So. Not on the coastal banks. Yeah. <coughs> All right, moving on. The buffers. 
Oh, I have one question about the ero I'm sorry about the erosion control. Brian, you said you were still developing your erosion control no, program. I, oh, I think we're just modifying it to include silt fencing all the way around, not just uh, upgradient of the uh, resource areas. Okay. All right. So if we have a condition that, okay, we can condition your erosion control. Let's see. Buffers. 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 Buffers are important in foul. Vegetative buffers are important. And I think one of the things that caused angst with everyone here is that at least lots one through seven are in the 50 foot A zone, the A zone to the 50 foot buffer to the coastal bank. And um, I'll have to ask Jen to help with the interpretation of the state. But, but there is one section that applies to the 50 foot buffer requirement. There's something about, I can, do you have your state there? Yep. It's 10.02. B2B. All right, hang on. Get into O2B2. And they talk about like conversion of lawn into, into uh, you know, like putting a shed, but you can't do something like that within 50 feet. And 2E. 10.02B2E. Um, this this section, Betsy, uh, means that these types of provided they comply with other subjects to the regulation. Um, Betsy, this section actually is minor activities that they don't have you filing a notice of intent for. That they don't have to buy. Yeah. yeah. So, oh. if you go back but, and you look but, at but they're B, they're saying that if you were going to do that, then you have to file yeah, a yeah. notice of intent. Yes. Okay. But in in the the beginning of the, this section, ten point oh two two B one, it says to reduce the yeah. potential for any adverse effects to the resource area during construction and post construction measures. And post construction measures implemented to stabilize disturbed area. How is this project going to reduce potential for any adverse effects? Post construction? That buffer. We're talking post construction. During post construction. How, how is clear cutting the buffer going to reduce, reduce adverse effects? To the, the to the role resources. Of this buffer. Yeah, <coughs> the role of the buffer in protecting those wetland resources. Yeah, I mean, um, adherence to the erosion control plan and the stormwater uh, pollution prevention plan um, will contain sedimentation, erosion, uh, keep uh, equipment and personnel outside of, in within the limit of work. Um, Post development. Um, oh wait a minute! Fine, provide. Relative to the uh, HOA requirements for covenants for maintenance, so there's no creep or encroachment towards those resource areas. That's a standard condition that's often implemented. Certainly, with the town property directly to the north, I think that would be um, more eyes on the project. Um, Okay, and then Randa just mentioned that um, there are currently proposed fences along the backyards. Um, split rail fences? Six foot. Okay, six foot uh, stockade fences, so that would contain any uh, future creeper encroachment towards those resource areas. That are wildlife friendly fences? Six inches off the ground. Yes, we can design those, yeah. Uh, maybe something uh, along the uh, on lo the back portions of lots 11 and 12, or sorry, 12 and 13. I would probably recommend something like a split rail fence back there. That's a little bit more wildlife friendly. Oh, absolutely. Um, you're going to have a fence back along that 
retaining wall? <coughs> we're, we're contemplating it, yes. It would definitely have to be a split rail um, on 12 and 13, and I'd like you to consider even a split rail on the northern part. Okay. We'll take a look at that next. Well, I would imagine that people living there would rather look at, you know, a nice wooded backyard, like woodland behind them instead of a fence. That, that's me personally. But, I mean, I think a, a split rail fence would allow for the passage of wildlife in that area <coughs> if there's any wildlife left. Well, of course, my, and so my, my last point is, and I brought in some other material which I'll, which I'll uh, submit to the record that comes from the Mashpee regulations. But the vernal pool, and I realize it's not a certified vernal pool, but you recognize that the vernal pool organisms there, you've seen them. Um, it's, it's just barely a hundred uh, foot limit to the, to the vernal pool, but in fact, this entire area is ideal habitat, upland habitat for the vernal pool species. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if the people who live there see wood frogs and, and yellow spotted salamanders, and will be seeing them within the next month there. So and, then, and I just have a final comment about the buffer. I, I thought your description, I thought it was a lovely description of the, of the um, you called it a moderately vegetated forest in upland, but you described the species that were there. And they're all native species. Yeah. It was, it's, uh, you know, it's like a perfect habitat. It's like what we would want people to develop a buffer. They had to develop a buffer. Unusually, no invasive. Unusually, yeah. I know. It's amazing. I mean, they're they're invasives to the east, and there's you know like there's English ivy kind of sneaking in from that house that's there. Any of us who any who live in neighborhoods who have a scourge of English ivy, it's it's a, kind of like a monster that you can't get rid of. But um, but anyway, it's a beautiful woodland. But that's all I have to say about buffers. All right. Um, now, one thing on this plan, is there going to be a path to the water? Yes, good question. Because it says in the legend that there was a pond access, but I didn't see any on... No, no thanks There's no those. pond access. Okay. I, I did see where it says some items will not appear on the plan, but I just want to make sure I didn't miss that. That's it. All right. So... I'm going to make a Betsy has gone to the bottom of her list of questions, and I'm just wondering if anyone else on the board has anything else they'd like to comment on, ask about. Yeah. You look like you do. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, uh, Are we sticking to a particular topic of Betsy's? No, at this point, it's okay. Okay. whatever is the uh, the, the endangered species, you said that you checked yeah, that. with the Massachusetts yeah. Wildlife uh, and uh, no. saw that this area wasn't designated for endangered species. Uh, some of the abutters have indicated that they have seen endangered species. Uh, in that area, uh, in uh, 10.59, estimated habitats of rear wildlife and so forth. Uh, I wonder if there is any uh, input for changes of reports of endangered species. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, we're aware that the abutters have submitted uh, records of eastern box turtles. It's a state-listed species of special concern, uh, I think, on a uh, property right around here in this location. Um, uh, while the site is not mapped as priority habitat or estimated habitat by natural heritage, uh, given the observations and those photographs that were submitted with the ZBA, <clears throat> we did proactively reach out to Natural Heritage 
um, to discuss whether or not they have any comments mm -hmm. or anything along those lines. Uh, because the, species, the site is not mapped within uh, priority habitat uh, and estimated habitat, they cannot assert jurisdictional authority on the review, but uh, through talking with the applicant, uh, we are voluntarily proposing to implement a natural heritage approved turtle protection plan. And that's where the um, evolution uh, for the silt fencing, the entrenched silt fencing, encircling the entire limit of work. And so what will be performed as part of the protection plan um, is that we'll, during the active season, around the entire perimeter, uh, we're gonna install that uh, entrenched silt fencing to function as a temporary turtle barrier. And then we'll be conducting turtle sweeps, pre-construction turtle sweeps, prior to site clearing within the interior of the footprint. Uh, so if any turtles are within the construction footprint, they will be relocated outside of that. Um, and that barrier will be maintained during construction so there's no breaches for turtles to get back in. And uh, there will be some contractor education. There will be reference materials passed around uh, to educate contractors, keep an eye out for this, and if they do find anything, what steps and measures uh, to appropriately relocate that individual. Can no. you submit your turtle protection plan to us, Brian? This, this yes, it hasn't been finished. yet prepared, but yeah, we can we can pull okay. it together. Okay, and if you were to relocate them, if you found any of them, where would you relocate them to? Uh, we'd relocate them um, in the eastern portion of the site. Again, there's, um, I, when I do these, I don't relocate on off property. I know that's town property. Um, you know, if, if the town is okay with that, I could do that. Uh, but typically, I would keep them on site. And again, that's, you have about 125, 150 feet to Little Pond. Okay. So after the construction is done, and the people have moved in the next year and the next year, if the turtles come back to the impervious surfaces, uh, that's loss of habitat? Mm -hmm. Yes? No? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the development footprint, I wouldn't qualify that as habitat post-development. Uh, you know, oftentimes in projects like this, We'll pass around like a fact sheet to homeowners just to educate them that, you know, if you do find a box drill in your backyard, just, you know, kind of let it be. If you do find it on a roadway, relocate it to a safe area. That's something we can, you know, typically um, submit as, as part of an HOA packet. Okay. The, the next thing is the uh, percent of development of the square footage of the overall uh, place. Uh, some of the documents refer to different percentages of uh, developed uh, land, which I would assume would be impervious, but uh, some of the things are contradictory. Uh, on page six of one document, it said 30% uh, of the overall land would be developed. Uh, another one said 40%. One of the abutters calculated it and said 60%. Uh, could you go over that? Um, I just want to interject. This is not in our jurisdiction. Well, I, 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 I can speak to it. Is the question um, disturbance or impervious coverage? Uh, impervious. Or both. Both. Um, so impervious. I, the site's 4.78 acres, I believe. The limit of works uh, a little under four acres. Uh, that would be the total limit of disturbance. Um, and the impervious is uh, 50. Oh, wait, that's per lot. Um, down here, lot coverage. By proposed structures, parking, and paving would be 34 percent. Does that include the road? That includes the roadway, driveways, um, houses, all potential garages, sunrooms, sheds, sidewalks, everything. 
What is it per lot? Um, it varies per lot. The, the maximum one was uh, lot 15, which is uh, the second one from the end there on the bottom, and that was 57%. Can, can we go back to your schematic for a second? The one, the, the little colored plan. These are the overall. That one. That one. But it doesn't really. So, okay. This isn't this because I can't really tell because there's green stuff going on to our property up there. But you're saying from where your light green is mm -hmm. on the northern property, so you have your dark green with circles in it. That's the forested buffer that Betsy loves so much. And we go to the light, yes, the light green right there. Yep. And you come straight down, yep. Yeah. You're telling, and you say this, 30% coverage. 34% within the property line, so including the area off down to the property line of the lawn. The property lines exclude the road that runs down the middle? Uh, no. Nope. We can, I can get you better, you know, a breakdown of that number, but. That would be helpful yeah, because exactly. visually it's I'm not thinking that, that the light green and the dark green don't add up to, you know, 66%. No, I don't think so. So if you could just kind of, you know, kind of break that down for us, that would be helpful. We, yeah, we prepared a, um, a chart for the zoning board that basically for a lot, um, coverage and all that I can provide. That would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you visually we're having trouble. But anything within the 100-foot buffer is within our jurisdiction. So could you give us those? With could you the, break that out also? Yeah. With that in the buffer the whole property. Yeah. So could you give us those with the whole project and then also within the buffer? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
plan at the same time with this condition be reviewed, or else we would condition it. But um, typically, we want to know what, who exactly is responsible for that kind of thing. And you've mentioned covenants <coughs> a few times, and I assume I, I, I assume the developer is not a. Um, will be out of the covenants, will be out of the homeowners association once the, the place is filled up, is that correct? Um, do you have boilerplate for something like that that we could see? He is going to submit you, it. You draft the covenants? Okay, so we'll work with, we can provide those. Okay, I would, I would like that, thank you. All right, anything else up here for now? Okay, um, so. Is there anyone out in the public who would like to make some comments or ask some questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, what? Yeah, I think so. I'll we'll take the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, sir. You have to um, introduce yourself. And I'm sorry, you also have to take <coughs> Take the mic with you. It comes yep, out. Comes of, okay. It comes Why out of the stand. If you would like to do that, if you would like to just take the microphone without the stand. Uh, I think you can do it. My name is Fred Nucci. Oh, thank you. And uh, I live right, right here. And right here, this, along my property line, I have cedars, about a dozen, a dozen cedars, that are about 20 foot high. And this bank. Where this road comes is sort of deceptive because what they're showing you is the base, and it's like a three or four foot elevation here. So, in other words, they're showing you this, but that's the bottom, and then it comes up 60 degrees to my property line where the cedars are. And I was wondering if it's possible that you could sort of put a little something here that's to enforce them to protect those cedars. And, uh, that's this is sort of a deceptive, like, as the border lines here. You really don't know what they represent. So. But I, that's all I have to say. Well, we could condition something like uh, required orange fencing. <coughs> that's fencing. not really our jurisdiction. Maybe we could write a note to zoning. Mm -hmm. Or if we have the permission, this permission to do that. Oh, it's not right. Yeah, it's, it's not, not our in our jurisdiction, so we can't put it in our order of conditions. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can see if you're in here. No, I was just asking, you're on the, the left side of? No, the right side. The right side. There's no sidewalk. Okay. Right. And you have a drain, I think, going there also. Um, no? <coughs> that's along the, uh, the top of the yeah. Is this a drain, a gutter? Uh, nope, that's a small retaining wall. That's the road? That's the road. Okay. And I assume the property line is right here. Right, it's that heavy black line, yeah. <coughs> this black line. Correct, yep. Because it's hard to even determine it from the actual plan exactly what happens here because the elevations are, are difficult to determine. In other words, if you had a, a profile in that section, it would be clear of what that could happen. Those cedars are about. 40 years old, 30 years old. Okay. And it'd be a shame to, because I don't think there's many cedars in the town like that anymore. Anyone else wish to speak? Right up. My name is Mark Stowes, and I own the property of 115 Lucerne with my sister Sandy. So we're down at the corner of Alma and Lucerne Avenue on, on that home. Sir, could you speak up a little bit? Because that microphone just goes to the, that goes to the, the TV audience. <laughs> oh, okay. That's why yeah, I didn't want to <laughs> yell. <laughs> but that's fine. So we live in the corner down, down on the corner of Alma and Lucerne Avenue. And so we sent in the pictures of box turtles. Yep. So on that one quarter acre that we bought from the Gongs on Lot 54, that's where those turtles live. So I'm just thinking, if we have three box turtles on one quarter of an acre next to our property, how many are in that whole area? So that's, that's one big concern. And I know that there's a turtle protection <coughs> plan that they're thinking of, but you know, when you're bulldozing down seven acres of forest, I'm just not sure how you're gonna be sure to 
relocate all those turtles. I, I think the key concern that my sister and I actually have about this whole development, I'm glad this is conservation, is because if you've been to the site, it's, it's the only remaining forested area in the heights is in that area. And it is the buffer between the heights and the development that we have there, and not only Little Pond, but the whole coastal bank, and then over into the very, very steep drop-off that goes into the vernal pools, right at the edge. So everything you've said about the sediment and the sand uh, concerns me, especially about the flooding. And I know everything is perfect in the first three years of development, and you hit on this issue with these, uh, what are they called, under the dry wells. Yeah, dry wells. Um, there's a lot of trees all along the border. The people that will probably buy these homes, other than the low-income homes or affordable homes, will probably be summer tenants. They don't maintain gutters, predictably, and things fail. And there's absolutely no room in this California-style development built in the heights, or planned to be built in the heights, for any leeway now that the entire forest is bulldozed. And we're talking about not a field, big trees, big oak trees, especially on this end by lots 12 and 13. Uh, and there's also, I think that there's a proposal for a sediment trap, B, and we wrote a letter about this too, about the fact that that's right, it looks to me like it's right in between 12 and 13. I can't really figure out, but the one diagram shows a sediment trap going right up to the coastal bank, but it's also right in the middle of those two homes. So a big concern we have, of course, is, again, that these things can overflow, and it shouldn't be located right on the coastal bank. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear also that if, if this were to proceed, that 12 and 13 would be moved closer to the road, because that's the only buffer that we have behind there. So I think that you know our, the key concern that we really do have, because where we live, is the flooding. And I know we talk about a 100-year storm. It seems like we had major storm events four or five times a year that led to flooding. And to your point, in the winter, when the snow is frozen, we get rain. It's just the nature of the climate here. And there's nowhere, and no drain is going to work when the ground is covered with ice, sleet, and snow. So, you know, once the developer is gone and we have this high, high, high density development that doesn't fit in with anything in the heights and takes away the one remaining forest that we have, after spending millions of dollars to clean up Little Pond, where does all that water go? We have a flood that goes down our driveway. We're 55 feet from the water, and all the water from Alma Street flows down our driveway and our neighbor's driveway right onto our backyards that goes right into the, into the pond. Even if it doesn't, my concern is with sand, that regardless of what we talk about with these drains, it goes into the soil, correct? I mean, the, these drains next to Mr. Nitchie's property are within 300 feet of the bay. So d doesn't that go through the sand? The, when you think about all the construction materials, the, root, the asphalt roofs, the asphalt road, 100 new cars, dripping oil, dripping antifreeze, where does all that go? Where do all those chemicals go? Don't they leach into the soil? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't have homes in our neighborhood already. I'm just saying that with the location of this and the density, originally this was planned for seven home sites. It's a lot different than 28 built one on top of the next. So, I mean, those are our key concerns. Destroying, you know, destruction of the remaining habitat, where the, the rare species do go, the endangered species, and how many there would be, and the impact on the whole environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Mike Hatch, and I live at 64 Alma Road in a butter, <coughs> excuse me, in a butter to the project. Uh, I really appreciate some of the enthusiasm the board has shown about wanting to uh, not only recognize but keep the uniqueness of. Uh, some of the stuff that's going on in this area, the swamp, the pool, obviously uh, Little Pond and the Coastal Banks. Um, I'll talk to them a little bit, but first I just want to mention that um, I have developed a property in the past. I do have an underground filtration system. And uh, mine filters underground, but it catches it from catch basins. 
And what I can tell you is, you get a lot more in these things than just sediment and leaves. Because they'll be catching everything from that street, they're going to get everything that everybody decides to throw out their car windows. And that's all going down there. And all I would suggest to the board is that uh, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not qualified to look at it or comment on it, but I would really look at some of the screening and filtering that's involved in the system uh, to make sure that it can't be clogged by things like that. Because you'll get, you'll get plastic cups, you'll get smoke cups, you'll get gum wrappers, you'll get cigarette butts, packages of cigarettes, lottery tickets. The list goes on and on. And they will all end up flowing through that system and possibly clogging it. Uh, with that said, any system can be designed to work perfectly. Unfortunately, there's the human element, which in this case is the homeowners association. The homeowners association, I'm assuming, will have <clears throat> a budget that they'll operate with. And what happens when all of a sudden your budget gets shy? Things don't get done. And I, I'm hoping, I do not know, I know you can condition the project so that the homeowners association has to do this type of maintenance just on certain <laughs> times during the year or yearly, bi-yearly. But I wonder if Falmouth actually has somebody who actually checks on the enforcement of this. And without enforcement, the condition is useless, unfortunately. It's, it's written and it's a backup plan that you can all say, hey, we put it in there. But ultimately, if it's not enforceable, then it probably won't happen. Um, as far as the environment goes, I'll just leave the board with this. I did sense a lot of enthusiasm. I just hope that the board will consider not granting any variances that they don't have to that would threaten what's going on here. If the law states that there's to be no building within a 50-foot buffer, just don't allow it. Just the, the law was probably well thought out when it was put in place. Stand by it. There's no need to deviate from it. If it's 100 feet, stand by it. There's no need to deviate. I know that there's a lot of uh, differences between some of the regulations and the Cape Cod Commission's uh, best practices. Vernal Pool, I think, is 100 foot by EPA, yet Cape Cod Commission's 350 feet. Cape Cod Commission's might be newer. It might be more relevant. It may be more applicable. So all I'm asking is this that this board really look at everything and you know it, it, it's fine to grant a little leniency here a little you know a foot here a foot here but if this a law in place that says you can't disturb and build within a 50-foot buffer for the benefit of the residents the abutters and everybody that lives in Falmouth just stand by the law enforce it thank you thank you yes sir Good evening, Edward Jallowit, 54 Alma Road. I'm at the corner of Worcester Court and Alma Road. I'm a direct of Butter. I want to thank the board for their volunteer time. You folks put in a lot of hours, and it's much appreciated by myself as an environmentalist and by a resident and taxpayer of Falmouth. So thank you. Uh, with that said, um, Mike mentioned the enthusiasm the board is showing. It, I think it's wonderful to see that. I want to point out um, something that's relevant because, you know, people talk about, well, storms are getting worse. They have been worse than they are now. In 1954 or 55 time period, there were multiple hurricanes came up the East Coast. The area directly behind this site, which is currently town owned, was underwater. Mm -hmm. It was totally submerged. And that's based on eyewitness testimony from people who lived here at that time. I myself did not. I was in Southern Connecticut and I saw what the storms did there. But that whole site, right up against those coastal banks on the north side, was flooded. And those banks are important to retain storm water. That area provides a buffer holding a lot of water, a detention basin, if you will, that holds it and slowly perks it back into the soil and into the ocean over time. Very critical to long-term flood protection. It happened in 54, 55 and it surely will happen again in the future. We talked about, I think one of you gentlemen mentioned um, the rains we've had recently and what storm is this system designed for. This past summer, I think it was July or August, we had a storm that gave Falmouth six inches of rain by my rain gauge, which I check regularly, in an eight hour period. Six inches in eight hours. 
Then it's just further up the coast, had eight inches from that same storm in roughly an eight hour period. This system would not retain that. It would end up in Little Pond. It would end up in my backyard. It will end up in the wetlands. Currently, this site is basically flat. It is entirely forested. No runoff comes off that site. It is all absorbed through that soil and very gently gets into the groundwater, hence to the pond and out to the ocean. The amount of impervious surface here is certainly in question. Uh, I did some rough calculations and I was very easily over 50% coverage, including the road, the houses, the driveways, the sheds, all of that. So the, the numbers don't make sense and I'm glad you're having that revisited. Um, part of the plan here, uh, I was shocked to learn they plan on bringing in 6,000 yards of fill and changing site elevations. Town of Falmouth has bylaws that prohibit regrading your property to direct stormwater to abutters and to wetlands and to town roads. You can't do that. Um, in the submitted plans, um, it showed a section at my property area increasing the site elevation from what it is currently to one and a half to two feet higher and then pitching it from the house at a two percent grade to my property. They would have this two foot wide stone trench which after about a year will be full of silt and during the winter will be frozen solid and that water will roll into my property. That's against town bylaws and town code. You cannot do that. Worse yet, as a homeowner I don't want it, but the wetlands, the swamp, the vernal pool, extremely sensitive has been stated by the board members how critical this environment is and how sensitive it is to change in water flow, to inundation by fresh water or salt water. You change that and you destroy it. This cedar swamp took hundreds of years to develop. There are trees there that are at roughly 100 feet tall. It is a very mature, healthy environment, but it's extremely sensitive to development and anything that might go on around it. So I urge you to stringently enforce any and all regulations that you can, as Mr. Hatch stated, and do not deviate one iota from them. They are designed to protect the environment, and they are very minimal standards. As Mike stated, Cape Cod Commission recommends much, much greater distance than what the town and state law allows. So please, by all means, do not deviate. Do not issue any waivers from this. Look closely at what is being proposed and potential damage. Uh, 12 years ago, this board reviewed a project that was in that same general area to the north that is now town land and issued 100 conditions on a developer. A fair amount of those wouldn't be relevant because this area is now sewered. But I would ask that you stringently look at all of the species that are in there, the risks to them, and enforce the law to the fullest extent. I'm worried about the runoff. Uh, this drainage system looks great on paper, but I don't think it could handle the big storms we've had. And what happens when the homeowners association is not viable? It may take 10 years or more for all of these lots to be sold. At what number of houses built does there become a viable homeowners association that can assume the responsibility financially and have the leadership to maintain these systems? I think the developer should be required to maintain this in perpetuity. Certainly uh, until there is a full build out and a viable certified, proven, however you want to call it, homeowners association that can maintain this because that little stone trench that's going to abut my property and all of the southern abutters isn't going to work. That's Mickey Mouse engineering. I'd be laughed out of college in the 60s when if I proposed that to one of my professors. And the big system with the infiltration basins, that needs rigorous main maintenance <coughs> and it's not going to happen if it's left over to a half a dozen homeowners that buy the first houses. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention to this. I look forward to the next hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Would anyone else like to speak? Oh, I had one question. Certainly. Yeah, they, well, they brought some more interesting couple things. Certainly. One of them was the um, the temporary sediment traps, which the one that's closest to um, the east to Little Pond. Um, could you give me some explanation as what that's all about? 
Um, as part of the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook, you need to provide a construction period, stormwater, mm -hmm. uh, erosion mm -hmm. control plan. So that would be um, a sediment trap designed to their standards. So it would uh, be sized to collect the first, I believe, inch of runoff and infiltrate it into the ground. Okay, I guess the, what, where I'm going with this, um, again, everything looks nice on paper. And when it rains, it rains. And that gentleman is correct. I remember that August storm well. Um, that maybe, again, we'll think about all this in, 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 the, con, in the conditions and findings, but maybe that wall is installed prior to the, the full-blown development. And that way there, at least it's given us another <coughs> buffer because if it's only a one-inch storm and we have an August eight-inch storm, that's going to overrun, and you put the sediment basin literally on the coastal bank. Yeah, we can look at sliding yeah. it off the coastal bank more. And I, mean, um, I don't know why you'd put it the closest to the resources. Um, it's located at the downhill side of the oh, site, yeah. so that's it's. And then the other question, <clears throat> thing I'm going to ask you to look up because I'm going to do it myself is in the town we do have a bylaw, and I cannot remember. It used to be a thousand cubic yards could only be moved on a lot unless you had a mining permit, but they did change the amount. And I think it's more than that now, but I can't remember off the top of my head because it was back in the early 90s. Um, and if that's the case, you know, again, you know, changing grades, changing um, flow off of properties um, is, you know, prohibited here. And um, and I would have to agree with that gentleman. I'm, I'm very concerned about that um, trench. And it's not on the legend, by the way. So just. I can add it to the legend. Yeah. Maura is a stickler for her legend, so make sure everything is on your legend, including the little bar with the, what did you call them, Courtney? Squigglies. The little it. squiggles. Gizzies. Gizzies. Oh, that was the word. Channeling <laughs> <Chill, laughs> your inner corvo. Gizzies. <laughs> oh, okay. That's Marcus. a door. There's a question regarding you. Know. Lewis and work and all that. Is your plan to build this liquid split like a year from first shovel full to finish? Or are you going to stretch it out over five years or ten years? Yeah. Or what? What is the plan? The plan is to put the whole road in. I'm sorry, sir. sir. You need to come up to the podium. I'm talking about the houses and all the construction <coughs> in this area. But the plan is to put the whole road in first with a you know a temporary coat and I mean I. I Honestly, I think the houses are going to sell within two to three years. So it's it's not you're not going to build them all. You're going to build them and sell them and build some more and sell them. That's so we may have doing some work up there for three or four years, and these barriers at the top of the hill will last for several years before, which you'll be maintaining. Is that right? You as the builder. Yes, we're going to be maintaining things. Yes, until the homeowner association takes over. I mean, I, I think the homes will sell quickly, but. You know, things things can change, but I think um, you know, I think within two to three years, all the homes will be built and sold. Thank you. Um, while we're on the subject, well, sort of on the subject, I believe we uh, you said somewhere in your application that this is going to be a uh, town road, public road, um, and I'm wondering if you've gone through the application. Oh, sorry. If you've gone through the application process for that, so we know about it. Yeah, we've talked to the town about the acceptance. Um, it will be built to town construction standards. The town has said that they would plow and collect trash and then um, potentially um, adopt the road um, as long as it's built to their standards. They, From talking to engineering, there's no formal process in place to accept the road. It's kind of something that's done. Well, there is a oh, formal a process, and it, take, process. it takes years. Well, that's, that's what they said it was a very, so we so, would be maintaining the road and the stormwater until potentially it was ever accepted by the, the town. We may never get it. Did, Did you say never, it will be maintained? I'm sorry, what? It may never be accepted. If yeah. it is, fine. If it isn't, then it isn't. Yeah, state uh, law requires that all roads be plowed. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the town has told us they're going to plow the road. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Well, they will plow the road. Well, no, the road's on the... Yes, um, go ahead. One of the, the <coughs> Mark just, again, made me think of something else. So if this is going to be a, um, you know, you, you're going to develop and build, develop and build. 
again, it brings us right back to, a, you know, are you going to denude the whole thing and then have a flat palette to start with? Or are you going to pick and choose and clear, pick and choose and clear? How are you going to do this? The plan would be to construct the road first. So you would clear what would be necessary to build the roadway. And then we would build houses in groups. It wouldn't be go in and clear cut the entire site. It would be clear cut, uh, clear cut. cut the section for you know, four houses. You can't houses. get around that word clear cut. It's, it's there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> You go um, lot by lot. lot. Go yeah. lot by lot. Yes, yeah, so okay, so they'd then, probably be developed in groups, but it would be a okay. lot by lot. So yeah. then we get back yeah, to the one who needs to, to get into the the, fil the filtration systems and how much maintenance they take. So you're gonna. So that means all these limits of work have to be maintained throughout this whole project, mm -hmm. um, and now you're you have these systems to take maintain with silt coming during all the construction. And I just, I'm concerned about that. Yep, there, there would be um, a construction period, erosion control plan. So all this, the inlets would have inlet protection controls, either dan, you know, uh, a dandy pop or a dandy sack type. Um. You know what they do? They clog, and then you have all the runoff. They do not, I mean, I know, it, it, again, nope. on paper. And the intention is that they do clog and collect the sediments, and they're maintained during the construction process by the construction crews. Well. Um, I mean, that's, that's the intent of that's them, the is to collect world the, the sediment. That we don't live in. We don't know but the, see that We will be, here. I mean, that will be one thing, that if this does go through, that that will be watched very, very closely by many, many people, um, that a week goes by and they're not, you know, we get a storm event and your, your, you know, your, your sediment sacks are all filled and they're not working. And then the neighbors are going to be inundated with water and everything is going to go in the wild. So you need to, I think in your management, Operation management. You have to really dot every I and T because we'll go through that very closely. Okay. Kevin. Um, in in terms of these walls that you're constructing all over the place, you're only going to install parts of these walls. Yeah. Um, as you develop the property, or are you going to install the walls and then? Yeah. yeah. Due to the, just the proximity of the houses, the walls would have to be pretty much constructed. So, you know, you would build lots 12 and 13 at the same time because the wall is there. You'd probably build lots 7 through 10 at the same time because the wall would have to be constructed to build those houses. And what about lots 14 all the way down on the southern side, which are you There's no putting that French drain along the back? That's going to be, you can't put half of it in, can you? Um, you that you could because it's just a level drain. It's not made to convey the water or yeah, um, either way. So, I mean, you could put it in by lot by lot. I don't think the intention would be, it would be, like I said, to kind of do houses in, you know, a block of four or something like that. Courtney. Um, so you're going to add this to your to-do list. That is a specific construction sequencing, specifically what you're, what you're going to do in day one, two, three, four. So that we know, put some dates on it, obviously they can change, but we want it specific. <clears throat> Not, well, we're going to build some here and some there. You know, we want a sequence that, that specifically minimizes issues of runoff mm -hmm. of, um, and so there's clear containment provisions and all of that. Mary, yes, um, Mary. The, the drainage that's on the um, along lots 15, 16, and all that mm -hmm. is that. How do you access that if it if it gets clogged during construction? It would just be to strip. Typically, it's uh, I think it's it's two feet deep. So the bottom 18 inches would be a coarser stone for to allow for more voids. The top six inches would be a a P stone or a finer graded stone. So um, we can put in the in the erosion control plan that at the end of construction that top layer is stripped off and replaced um, that would be the maintenance would be you know monitoring it when it's it's clogged with sediments that stone layer would be replaced so again maintenance and, and weather so this is basically just an open French drain mm -hmm. correct yes yeah okay have you put um, these in somewhere else yes we have 
I have a question, uh, definitely not in our purview of responsibility, but uh, if you're going to be uh, constructing this in pieces, is there some sort of a commitment that uh, the uh, low income uh, uh, parcels will be constructed either uh, definitely or uh, in sequence? Are we selling lots uh, 12 and 13 and calling yeah, No, 25% the of the homes are affordable, so you do it like for every three market rate homes, you build an affordable home. Okay. So that's, that's the way you do it. Thank you. Um, Jen. No, Mary, I just, when you're done, I've been writing down all the different things that, and I can kind of go over that list so everybody's on the same page. And if I've missed something, the board can let me know. All right, that okay. sounds fine, Betsy. Thank you. Betsy. So, well, I just want to go back to these French drains again. And, and I can imagine, especially in winter like we just had, we're having them filled and then iced and then having the water flow over. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better to have a vegetated swale? I was thinking that. Mm -hmm. um. Yes, it basically it's, I mean, we construct them both ways. We can construct vegetated swales. We do the swales with a, a stone strip at the bottom to kind of facilitate and bump up that infiltration. That's something kind of what we're proposing here. I mean, it is a vegetated area. It's a vegetated depression with the, the stone at the bottom as an extra measure, really. Are you doing any sort of vegetation on top of the stone, like any sedges or rushes or kind of constructing like a thin little... Kind of um, wet, almost like, like a, a, a like stormwater wetland. Library. Yeah, just a really thin drainage <coughs> swale. You could look at that. Vegetated. It, you know, they're basically located in the backyard right in front of the, the fences, so part, we could incorporate some of the backyard vegetation. Um, well, you would want wetland vegetation in these vegetation. in these drainage swales. Our, our library. Has yeah, we wouldn't be proposing any wetland vegetation in garden. people's backyards or rain gardens from a maintenance issue and okay. an individual homeowner, you know, taking care of these <laughs> measures. Okay. I mean, well, could you just look into the, into yes, we the yep. options of maintenance? I mean, I'm not sure that maintaining a, a rain garden would be any more difficult than a failed swale, a failed, failed drainage, yeah. French drains. French drain, like it would be easier, but more sustainable. Um, okay, do we have anything else? Um, and Jen, if you would, I, I can go over the list. Go through the list, and that will probably help the applicant with deciding on schedule. Now, if the applicant has something written down that I do not, that doesn't mean you can't don't have to do it. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Okay, so you're going to provide your cut and fill calcs to the board, um, the wall details, so we can determine whether or not we want the walls pulled back from that northern property um, boundary and the eastern coastal bank. Um, you are going to look at relocating the houses on lots. 12 and 13 more landward um, so that you can either move that wall or eliminate it completely along the top of that coastal bank. You're going to submit your operation and maintenance plan, including who is responsible for the stormwater system. Brian has permission to update his delineation on the white cedar swamp. Um, we'd like to see an updated erosion control plan. Uh, you said you were updating that to include the entrenched silt fencing, so we'd like to see that. Um, staff, myself, would like you to consider if you are placing fences um, along these properties that on the northern property and along the little pond properties that you consider split rail fences instead of large stockade fences. Um, I'd like to see your turtle protection plan, although I'm, I'm very familiar with what they look like. I would like to, to see your plan, um, especially um, if you're going to be doing this in a, uh, you're going to have a certain sequence, so we're going to want to see your construction sequence and then obviously 
you know, the turtle um, protection plan, um, especially during the season, is going to be active through each phase. So your construction sequence and phasing. Um, your impervious coverage. So we'd like to see the impervious surface coverage for the entire project and within our jurisdiction. So total, by lot, and then within our jurisdiction, total and by lot. Um, you're going to look into looking at mm, the maintenance of rain gardens versus the, the uh, stone swales. And Mary, you wanted to see a draft covenant yeah, for a homeowner yeah, like situation? To understand better how that's going to work. And okay. Have I missed anything? The wall, the, the drainage yeah, the wall, of the wall. Methodology. No, I have, I have wall details. Oh, oh, okay. Wall. Yeah, to get rid of that swale. Oh. No, yeah. Yeah, that's what I have left. Yeah. What, the spillway? The spillway, spillway. I'm sorry, the spillway. Mark, you No, answer. that was it, the wall. Okay. The spillway, and then? The wall of the spillway. The wall of the spillway and uh, provision for uh, flow out of the weep holes. Right. Yeah. And and for the drainage along the, um, the south side for frozen ground calcs, if you're not going to do the rain garden, because if it's frozen, I, it can't leave. Yep. And I, the bylaw for the town for the um, how much fill can be brought on or moved around the site. Oh yeah. <clears throat> and an engineer. Uh, if the walls are four foot or larger, they have to be engineered, structural engineer, and building's going to require that. Yeah, building's going to require it anyway, but we require it too. Um, this, is, this is for the next. Yeah, snow proof. Yeah, you've got staking yeah, in the, 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 It's already staked, but yeah, yeah. to look at the okay, staking. The, Construction sequence. Uh, yeah, thank I you. I got that. Some, yeah. I mean, can I just ask a question on the staking? Um, if you have a particular method that you want at stake, can you share that so that we can? We'd like the resource. The resources are all supposed to be staked. Where's the coastal bank? Where's the 50 foot, 100 foot buffers? I believe those are, are flagged, but I, I, I I'm just asking if, if what we have for flag today isn't. Adequate and it's confusing. How can we I'll, I'll, never, I'll get a hold of you tomorrow. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Jen. Just I just me, want to make sure it's done correctly. Give, give, and give me a call. Next Brandon, give me a call tomorrow okay. and we'll go over that. On, on the staking the boundaries, you're staking like the precise location of the limit of work. You're staking. The walls. The wall exactly, including where the footings are going to go. Um, obviously, things like all of the things on your map, your um, drawings that show you know road layout, where drainage is going to go. You're going to transfer your essentially. You're going to transfer your um, drawings onto the ground. Well, they did the center steps. line of the road, Courtney. Yeah, the center line. The center of the line of the road's fine. Yeah. yeah. That's well, fine. I want to see the lots laid out, too. So that gets us to the river road, please. The corners of the lots? Yeah, all of, I want to see everything. I want to see where the houses are staked. I want to see the corners of the lots. I want to have those reference points. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm looking at. House has to be done. Yeah, um, I, I think that's the I kind of ambitious. We, we don't always require well, that. Every house be done. A lot of buildings. Because I know you're imaginative be. enough to say, yeah, and it would only be our jurisdiction. And I know you're imaginative enough to say that this lot is here and the house looks this big in it, that you can transfer that imagination from one to the other. I don't want things like imagination. What if we just had the mistake as far as the lot of the house? Do lot corners. The back line yeah. of the house. Um, the yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I was actually thinking of the front line. Yeah. Yeah. So we can see where they are in respect to the resource area. So just the top, the northern side of the roadway, we could do four house corners on each lot. And right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that and then the wall, the proper line, take stuff out of our jurisdiction. House corner. Yeah. Maybe the, the lot line. I yep. 
Well, we have to have the lot lines because we so trespass if we don't know who's lawn. Yeah. Property line. It's not, but it's in our jurisdiction. We'll have to do it within our jurisdiction. All the way All right. over by Worcester um, Court. Has this been, has another question. Yes, um, I, well, I was looking in the audience for somebody that was far more educated than I am about it, but <coughs> has this been approved for the sewer hookup? Um, it would be part of the zoning process, I believe, so that's still okay. pending, yes. And the zoning commissioner has already said that there's plenty of capacity and there's not an issue. Well, I, there I is capacity, just, but there's a limitation on what can be discharged. They, she's because already they, ruled that it's not an issue. Okay. Well, I just saw the sewer hookups, and even though it's not in our, I mean, it's not a septic system, which is usually in our jurisdiction, if they haven't been approved, then it kind of makes all of us a moot point. So. Who is she? Yeah, uh, we've been she? coordinating with Amy Lowell, okay. the wastewater Thank you. superintendent. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. I kind of figured. I just wanted to hear she's it out loud. Thank you. Yeah. She's, been, she's been great so far. Yeah. She she's is good. She's been very easy great. to deal with and quick to answer questions. Yeah, she so. is. She's very good. Okay, um, so I think you probably want to uh, request a continuance, and let me just remind you when you pick a date that we require everything, that's the whole submission, to be in the Wednesday before by 5 p.m. A week before? A week before, a week before by, yes. no, it's a week before by 4.30. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's like noon. Noon. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I don't mean to do that. It's a week prior by noon. And this is because you guys come in to grab your stuff yeah. for that night and you grab your... I'm not sure you heard this. I'm sorry I said the wrong thing. It needs to be in by noon that day. So how long do you need, Brandon? Brian? Staking. Week before. Just to, to submit all the additional information. And I have several people telling me to remind you that it needs to be staked a week before as well. Um, we're not meeting on the 14th of March, so um, would you prefer like the 21st to give yourselves a little bit more time or the 7th? Uh, the 21st. 21st? Okay. The 21st of March? Of March, yeah. We're not the meeting on the 14th. The I make a motion to continue this to March 21st. To March 21st. Second. Um, okay, we have. I believe we have another member of the public who wants to speak. Is that right? No. Oh, no, you don't. No, okay. No, yeah. All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, Opposed, uh, unanimous. So moved. Thank you all very much. Brandon, give me a give me a call. Oh, there you are. Give me a call tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Art, Excuse me. Yeah. I just want to make sure the public, in case you want to come to the the next part of the hearing, it's March twenty first. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's the developer's name? Yes.
Was that so much fun doing the old little pond project? How many hours? Come here. Come here. No. No, we do not. All right. So, moving along. Next week, um, we have a can, uh, did we open this one? No, no, we okay, did not. So that's why it's just a bit. All right. Uh, another uh, notice of intent, Lawrence White, 194, Haskett Road, East Falmouth, Massachusetts. Request to amend the existing order of conditions, DEP 25-4150, to install two floats approximately 8 foot by 11 foot long along the dock to store jet skis. Yes, Madam Chairman. Um, this is an amended order. And would one of you gentlemen like to come up and make a presentation? John, I'll take a green cards. Betsy, those green cards go into Helmet Circle? Yep, I will. Okay. Oh, this is for Helmet Circle. That's for Helmet Circle. Right. Thank you. They're always important. And these are for? An elastic. Do you have an elastic? I might have one if you lost yours. Green cards. It's the back one. Pardon me? Great gaggle of swans you got back here. Pro you need to just give a brief description of your proposed project, sir, or your proposed amendment, which is adding your jet ski floats. Okay. Okay. Um, I bought the property, like, I think it was four years ago, I'm not sure. Um, immediately, I um, applied for a, um, a talk to the town of engineering and um, okay. went through the whole process. Uh, it came in front of the school. I think Mike Marcelli came in front of the board on several occasions, and that was approved. And um, I think the process took like two years, and finally it was done probably three or four months ago, oh, right before the summer ended. Um, and I mean, it was with no intent. I mean, there, there was jet skis. I've seen jet skis come in that waterway, and uh, we've been out there on our jet skis, and there's five or six of them, I mean, all over them, all over that inlet. I mean, million dollar homes, they have these two jet ski, the same exact thing I, I you know, have. So, thinking nothing of it, I just ordered the two jet skis. I mean, they're floating ramps, and the jet skis come in, and I, actually I thought it was more, almost environmental better, because it's not sitting in the water. I mean, as soon as you pull it in, every single time, you pull it on this ramp, and it just kind of floats up. So it's never, it's never touching the water. Um, and like I say, I never thought anything of it because there's so many on our, on our inlet. And then we got a letter, I think, uh, I think Jennifer sent the letter like, originally. And yeah, I always get to be the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we contacted the office. Um, but I, I, like I said, there was no intent. I always thought it was, it was allowed because there is so many, and I always thought it was good because they're lifted out of the water. It's, it's, they're yeah. not sitting in the water. <clears throat> Given where you live, Pretty much anything you want to do, you should contact our office. Um, I, 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 yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mark, Jen, do you have anything you'd like um, to say? N no, I, I did explain to Mr. White that you know the the floats, you know the combined all the combined float areas do do exceed, you know what's allowed under bylaw. Um, and that he may want to look at, if the board did not approve the floats, may want to look at a, some sort of lift system. Mm -hmm. I know we have, you have approved that type of system before where they bolt to the side in the jet ski, almost goes on just like the floats, and then it's, just yeah, it just lifted up, um, but the board can decide that. 
Um, they're floating, they're floats. Right. And you have a fixed T. Do you know how much water those floats draw? I really don't. I mean, okay. I know when the jet ski goes, is on it, it's sitting out of the water. You know, the whole. The, the jet ski itself. is. Yeah, the jet ski. The, the float itself is out of the water, is sitting out of the water. And the jet ski is on top of it. So it does, it does rise, you know, out of the water. Okay. The, the float's on top. It has, it has the ability to hold the weight of the jet ski. So the float itself is above the water. So like I said, the, the jet ski is never sitting, you know, in the water, which I would think would be better. Um, anybody like to begin down there, Mark? Oh, I'd rather see jet skis on this than pulled up onto the shore, I can tell you that. You've seen that. It's, it's better that they're not pulled up. I mean, we used to do that, believe it or not, before we got this. I don't even know what the rules are as far as that's concerned, but that's what we used to do. Is you'd pull them up there, and you'd go up, and then you'd come back. You're not supposed to do that. See, I, I didn't know that. Um, Peter. Yeah, uh, when the dock went in, uh, it didn't tell you that you had one boat or two boats or three boats. Could you have uh, said one of the uh, dock to store the, uh, the uh, jet skis would be a boat or what? what was is the, the configuration? I mean, the intention was sort of a way to, to get a boat. I mean, yeah. I have no idea what kind of boat. I've never had a boat in my life. Uh, I have two kids. Uh, my wife wants this little boat. She wants one that's just you know, can get out and go to the beach on like Belmont and my kids want if they can go over to Martha's Vineyard. So it's not going to be a big boat. I really want a smaller boat, but I really didn't know when we applied for it. <clears throat> when I applied for it, I had two jet skis. So I always thought that was going to be easier and eventually we would get a small boat, but I, I never, I, I never knew what, what, what it constituted. I didn't know it was only held to one boat. Well, the float for the jet skis, is that one float or two floats? It's two. Um, you can have them connected, but I felt it was better to put them on the op. Like the dock runs like this, with the yeah. T being out here. Yeah. So I put one on each side of, of, of On this. the inside of the T. So they wouldn't be together. So it would be easier to, you know, pull in rather than if there was one on there, they'd be, you know, they'd be self-contained. Okay, that's it. Anybody else, Kevin? I. So you found out that you couldn't uh, just do this as a result of a letter from Jennifer? Correct. You know, I gotta say, it's, uh, it's better than having you charge them up onto the bank of the, but as the chairman said, Given where you live, uh, you know, if you put on a, an awning, you might want to consider getting a permit for it. No, I, believe me, I, I, like I said, the only reason that I would even think about it is because driving up that inlet, they're all over the place. There's, there's a $2 million home down, this, down on, on my inlet that has a, a double one side by side. They, they're all over there. I just never ever thought that it was something that I had to... Um, said do. I, I don't know. I, I agree with you 100%. I know that now. Even though your order of condition says only one boat? The right. order of what? Your order of conditions that uh, when you were, uh, uh, your application for the dock was approved, you received an order of conditions from this board which told you what you could and couldn't do out there with the dock, with respect to the dock. I, mean, I, I never equated the, the boat with the jet ski because there's never, I'll never end up having two boats. I, I, I just didn't know that. It, it's not really about a boat versus a jet ski. Right. It's about the installation of the dock. And um, <clears throat> I know that. Although there is a there is a mooring field depicted also that um, is which is shows where your boat your would plan? go if you got a boat. Every plan for the dock is required to. Show where the boat would be. Right. 
and, and or so watercraft mooring, boat watercraft watercraft yeah watercraft. and so you have a mooring field that's on the outside but my, my feeling I mean this these two uh, whatever they're called jet ski floats is, is a, a bigger surface area right. than the dock is that's the problem if, which and the problem as far as the environment is that it's it's blocking any kind of sunlight. You know, it's creating a completely different environment underwater than if you had sunlight going through there. And so I I wouldn't be opposed <coughs> to you having, you know, some kind of a lift system. So you came in and you and you, you know, had dabs and you just pulled them up. But I but having permanent floats there is going to completely change what's living underneath there. And if you're going to have these, you know, I, I, well, you already have, how many is this? 100 square feet, which mm -hmm. is the limit. It's the limit. Which is the limit. The dock itself. The floor. But um, when we permit docks, we also usually have something in there about the amount of light penetration that they have to provide. Um, well, that's primarily over. The, the, well, over, over land, marsh. primarily, yeah. but. Um, I mean, if the jet skis are in the air, is the sunlight, it can't penetrate the jet skis, so there'd still be a shadow over there. Would that make a difference? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I purchased something expensive. I realized that the money's on me, but, but it just its it, it just seemed like it was just, it was out of the water. It's raised out of the water. I mean, the other one would be too, but would it be out of the water as much as if, like, is it a deal to bring that in and crank it up every time, or would you just forget to, to put it in sometimes and leave it there for a few hours before you crank it up? I mean, I don't know, environmentally, I'm just saying, would it, would it more or less end up being the same? Ideally, you would remember, but... <laughs> Steve? No, no more questions. Maury, um, well, this dock, when it was permitted, was a flow-through graded dock. Um, it also, there, there are other issues there. I don't want to set a precedent. I think it, you know, a better way to get these you know, out, of the, out of the water or docked for you and not being pulled up on the salt marsh. But as soon as we open that floodgate, FYI, that's a slippery slope that we were gonna, gonna go down real fast, yeah. um, of allowing people to start putting add-ons to these docks. And then all of a sudden they'll say, well, then they become permanent. Anyway, it's just not a good precedent. Our regulations say 100 square feet, that's what it says, black and white. There's also the lighting on that dock is not what was permitted. Um, it shows Excuse me, as far as that, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I hired a, 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 um, a licensed electrician to come and put dock lights in. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying they're not according to your plan. And un unfortunately, when you have waterfront property and you have these special, the, you know, the dock or whatever, they get permits and they get conditions applied to them. And right. the condition that was applied to your dock was the lighting. And it's on your plan, it's in your order conditions, and it's actually on your Chapter 91 license. And unfortunately, probably the electrician did not have this in his hand when he was putting the lights up. So the lights are supposed to be down along the, the, you know, the ramp, not standing on top of the post. And I know what you're going to say. Everybody has them. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> and they do. But <laughs> mine are like that. Mine are, mine are down on the, on the bottom, all the way over on the left-hand side. But I saw something that, that, that okay. Jen, you said, uh, it was a 60 watt bottle or something, yeah. but the lights are all on, on the bottom, all on the post. Yeah. There's five of them. Okay. And there, we didn't get a, I don't know if we ever got a revised plan, but that's rather, it's just for the water, which was no big deal. Um, and then the, the, I'm going to get off the dock because you had to get down the coastal bank to get to the dock was the patio, fire pit, whatever all that is up on the coastal bank. Right. That's not permitted either. But I didn't the, find the, that the, patio, the patio was there in the beginning when we got bought the property that was like, it wasn't exactly like that. We brought in like the, 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 the cobblestones and put them on top and we did put the um, fire pit in. 
but that was all dug out before. We didn't cut, there was no trees cut or any. Nope, there weren't any trees cut no. according to this plan, but the plan of reference for that dock does not show, and the date of this plan is 2015, October 28th, there is no patio fire pit on this plan. No, we, de we have definitely added the fire pit there. Okay. On top of that, yes. So, unfortunately, when that happens, there's got to be mitigation for it because you've now put this structure there. But we're, we're still in the jet ski aspect of it. That's another whole problem. Um, I would, as a member of this board, I would hope you come up with a better idea of how to do that without those two floats. Thanks, Maury. That's it. Courtney. Um, it's not much I can add, but I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable permitting those floats. Um, I appreciate you want to try to get the jet skis not on, uh, dragged over the uh, salt marsh and that kind of thing, but you may be able to come up with a different way of getting them out of the water and uh, wherever you want to put them. And you also need, sir, if you, you just pull out your old um, permit because it would help you a lot. You, you still don't have your um, street number, your DEP number, your address on the dock. And that's a requirement when you get your building permit to put them on and also your Chapter 91 license. Do you still have your order conditions? We can provide a copy if you need um, If I don't have it, I'm sure Mike Paselli has it. He's got to go through the final stage. Yeah. Anyway, so. I'll make a motion to close and take it under advisement. Can I ask a question first? Yes, sir. Yes. I'll second, but I have a question. And that is, what's the, did you ask this question? How much area is between those floats and the bottom? Well, I asked what the drop was on those floats. Yeah. I mean, so there's the three points. There was none. There's, so, I mean, there's 3.7 feet of water, and your regulations state that any floating dock, any floating kind of, um, any float yeah. needs to have at least three feet of clearance between the lowest portion of the right. float and me, like mean low water. So we don't know even though whether it meets those conditions. No, I'm surprised Mike didn't put them on the plan. I wonder about that. Motion and second? Yeah, motion and second. Well, one, one second. Do we, do we want to get that information from Mike before we close this? Well, I'm personally not going to vote for adding two 100 foot dogs. It would just be an expense. <coughs> Okay, we have a motion and a second to close the hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 So we will be deliberating probably next week. Or the week yep. um, and voting on this. Um, so aye. wait a minute, we're the 14th. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have trouble with that dude. All right. Good night, Sam. Good night, night, Sam. Sam. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we go to that dog. Okay. Vote order of conditions. 028 and 33, Brenton Road West. <coughs> oh. Yes, hang on. I'm getting the quorum. With a purple shell. Huh? With a purple shell. Kevin, Peter, Mary, Betsy, Maury, Courtney. Wait, Steve, were you on this one? Yes, I guess there's nothing to be done about it. So I just want to make a comment. Wait, I, ha I have something to add. Betsy, why aren't you adding Steve to these? He might. Was he all of them? Um, is that me? Are you sure I? I'm sure he, this is he your. Missed something in the past month. I'm he sure. He was here last week, though. But yeah, were you but here on the 24th of January? And we had two hearings on this one. Yes, we no, did. Maybe not. Okay. 
Betsy, in the future, do me a favor, write everybody that's here on those nights, not just the quorum, right. everybody that's here, yeah, he here, and we'll figure out the quorum. Right. Well, I'll You're just write the people who aren't on the quorum at the bottom of the list. Yes, that's fine. Look, I added Steve. Yeah, but he's not on the quorum. I right. know that, but, but that's not what this it is. It has a lot to say. It's kind of a oh, fail-safe. Write down everybody who's here. So we then we're not, not, you know, no. just kind of leaving somebody off by accident. Steve, were you at the first hearing for this, or no. just no. this? No, okay, not. that's it. He's, okay. He's not. Okay. All right. So here we have our 600 cubic yard dune replenishment. All right. I I want to make a comment. Fine. That's good. So I understand where you were going, Maury. But when they put that out, when they finish, when they finish putting the stuff out and raking here and there, then they have to do a they have to do the profile. Yeah. But there's no sense in having them do it all the way along. Let them just finish and move over. If this profile's a little light, or if this profile's a little. You're so trusting. Well, it's a maximum of 600 <laughs> cubic right. yards. That they're going to bring us the tickets. But they have to bring us the tickets. Them to okay. But the thing is, is we had the fluff factor. And anybody that works in dirt knows that there's no fluff factor in sand. Okay? Wet sand has no compaction rate and it has no fluff factor. So somehow. I was the one who brought up the question about. Somehow they got 150 cubic yards of fluff. And I'm sorry. I mean, you can. Blondie isn't that blonde. I mean, <laughs> so well. Um, it and, may have been that uh, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I think what happened is when the dredging over at Rand's Canal said they were going to have 600 cubic yards right. available, they put their little stamp exactly. on it and said we want the 600 cubic right. yards. They designed a, a, a beach profile with the first plan with 600 cubic yards. Right. So. They had to come up with those calculations somehow. Right, and I got them to admit that at the hearing. But the right. basic premise is you're getting 600 yards. And so they that's found what a place for it. And they found a place for it. And that's why they went all the way to transect E or F, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have the same exact amount of dirt, but we've cut the project in half. So, how do you still need 600 cubic yards? If you almost cut the project in half, you need 300 cubic yards. Fluff factor or no fluff factor? So. My feeling is that if they, and you know, we do an awful lot of after the fact where we go, okay, well, they did it again. My feeling is this is a safe gap that as they're bringing it on, they know how much they need. Not, you do not give a truck driver with a 10 wheeler and a load of sand the liberty to just go out and go, well, here, you've got it. And then they've, they've got this big, huge, they keep bringing it and bringing it. And then they just keep trying to put it somewhere. And before you know it, they're going to have a beautiful beach, not rocky into tidal anymore. And they're going to have a coastal dune that's probably going to be taller. And that's not what they asked for. And that's not what we were going to permit them for. Right. They did definitely did not ask for beach nourishment. Um, so that's my concern. It's not that I'm saying that they're not going to do a beautiful job. But it will keep somebody in check as they're doing it. It's, it's like the clerk of the work. You know, we, we had it on the dredge. We want to make sure that there was somebody on that dredge that's going to be calculating the depth and how much is being taken out at Rand's Canal. Well, we're doing it in reverse on how much is going to go back on this person's doom. You know what yeah. I'd suggest? What? Ask them to put in poles along those transects. You can drive in poles. Yeah, and just put a mark on it. And just put a mark. That's all. how high it's supposed to be. That's exactly all I All right. Yeah. So, Jen, did Hang you get it. that? That's how we think they should do it? Well, that's how they did it at Menon. Yeah. And then when they fill up and it's to the line, they're done. Right. They right. don't necessarily need to use and get all who'll 600 go out, yards. And who will go dig down and see where that line originally was and then they just covered it up and put a new line. <laughs> just keep going to stick. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. such <laughs> a trusting soul. After 25 years of this, I don't trust anymore like I used to. I've seen it all. I try. Okay, so prior to the spoils being placed, stake the seaward extent, right? Mm -hmm. Up, and then along the transects, put vertical poles. Drive in a pole, sand, as much sand can be put in. 
Sort of like the full line. I know. On a measuring cup. And they flag where the, the top is. Yeah. Make right. Them, make them put the elevation on this, on there too, so they can't yank the pole up. Oh, they just put a new line on the top. But they didn't. Done. They didn't give us really a. Oh, they did. They did give it to they us. They gave us transcripts. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Uh, I think they were Jeff's. Said. Yeah, he forgot them the first time. He kind of winged it, and then the second time. So was, with yeah. profile. The swell factor is trying to Okay. Yeah, I I know. I, I'm kind of with swell. So basically, they're proposing to remove the slipper shell and add approximately 600 cubic yards. Proposed. And the slipper shell was only supposed to be removed to the to the rocky end of the title to the to the, um, the boulders, right? The, you know, the you leave the cobbles. Cobbles. That's the word I was looking for. Well, I'm just gonna say. Um, that the slipper shells can only be removed above the four foot contour line because that's where their dune nourishment is, right? Yep, they were only yep. removing mm -hmm. the slipper shell where the yes. dune was. Yeah, and they said it was going to be about 30 yards. Okay. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah, driveway. Well, Mr. Humphreys did say the applicant would like as much sand as he could have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they have to cease and desist the mowing. Oh, yes. yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. On both properties. They need to, I have as one of the conditions, they need to, um, prior to placing the sand, they need to come up with a grain size analysis for both the dredge spoils and the existing coastal dune, and that, that has to be provided to us because they haven't done that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Yeah, that was on. Um, and they have to prove to me that it's suitable material for yeah. dune restoration after a recent event. Um, no, I'll tell you later. Um, I have that the you know they they're gonna be removing the slipper shells with you know by manual labor and machines and obviously they have to have the absorbent pillows or some sort of spill kit on site just in case <laughs> it leak oil. oil. Yep. Um, I'm going to basically and I can get this far get um, copy their uh, their um, Beach um, profiling, their what do I call it? Their beach monitoring, monitoring plan. So they're going to have to do a, a um, basically a survey immediately after mm -hmm. after placement, and then once a year, how they described along each transact. Or I would say once a year, or there's been a major storm, major storm event. event. Has okay, changed Dune the monitoring and after major storm events. I'm trying to remember, did they? This Although is one where they requested five years. Is it? Yes, it is. It is. That's okay. Yep. No. Yeah, they wanted to be able to add. No. Yeah. No. I want to see where right. the sand is going before, yeah, exactly. and I think right. I, I think I stated that in the hearing. Right. Yes, you did. Yep. I'd like to see that. Um, there's something run transects, post nourishment things. Wait a minute. Stop mowing. Sand sample grain size analysis. Look at new sand. Um, did you want? I have land. Um, eelgrass monitoring. Do you want eelgrass monitoring or? Um. Well, how about if the profile changes drastically? Then, then we would ask for that. Okay. Because it was disturbing. It wasn't just those. Um, Crepidia. Crepidula. Crepidula shells. It was scallops and cohorts. And they're only going to remove. They're only going to remove thirty cubic yards of crepidula, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It was actually one of the most diverse mm -hmm. five beaches, beaches I've ever seen. That's why amazing. I. Yes, amazing. It was. 
It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. <laughs> That's what was all, yeah, it was, I kept it just because it's very rare you see so many bivalves in one spot. Yeah, I have, they wanted a five-year permit, and I have something written down that. Yeah, that's amazing. Only one foot of sand with, wait, only one, oh, that was a question. That was a question you guys had. Only one foot of sand with 600 cubic yards is when Betsy was doing her calculations. Yes, right. <laughs> she went through that a couple times. And, no, and he did say that there would be no overtopping of the dune. Right. Mr. Humphrey right. said that. Yeah, okay. I'll add these to what I already have. And obviously, when what are they else gonna did plant I? the beach grass on that? They're gonna have to plant it immediately yeah. afterwards. Yeah. If they're putting the sand, they're dredging. They've already started. They've started dredging. Okay. So, or they're going to start dredging in so weeks. So they might make the window. They might make that window. So they have to plant immediately after. Anything else down there? I move we accept this discussed. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. So moved. We're done. We're done. We're done. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. I may do men's downhills on right now. Courtney and I, Courtney and I, 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 I